Hey guys, welcome. Can you see and hear me? If you can see and hear me, just give a quick thumbs up so that we can start the session. I think uh, whatever I'm looking at here, my audio visuals are basically very good. Good evening, Dr. Rahul Sahu. Good evening, Dr. Meet. Good evening, Dr. Roshan. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Medicine Saturdays with Dr. Dilip at Cerebral. Hi guys, yes, good evening, good evening, good evening. Thanks for all of your love. Today our session is going to be endocrinology. So we're going to have 20 MCQs as usual and all those 20 MCQs are going to be very, very high yielding. We're going to have a very good discussion of all those 20 MCQs. So let us move on to the session straight away. Good evening everyone, okay. I think it's a wonderful Saturday for all of us. So let us finish the Saturdays on a high. Okay. I'm good, Dr. Varjit. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking. I'm good, Dr. Vikash. Thank you so much for asking again. So let us move on to the discussion. Okay. So today we are going to have 20 question discussion. So low volume. I don't think it's a low volume though. Is it is the volume low? Or is the volume okay? The volume is low. Okay, so just wait on. I'll just try increasing. Can you hear it better now? Is the volume okay now? Is it fine now? Is it better now? I think like I have increased the volume nicely now. So now fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm seeing actually a very good uh, spike. Initially, it was a little low. Yes, that's correct. So I think now it's adjusted. Yeah, thank you. Good to go. Okay, cool. So let us start our discussion and let us move on to the question number one. So production of which of the following hormones would be most impact by the lesions that affect the pituitary stalk or the hypothalamus? So that's the question. So you are affecting the pituitary stalk or the hypothalamus. So which of the following hormones will be most impact? Is it ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone or is it growth hormone or is it uh, ADH that is antidiuretic hormone or is it prolactin? Okay, you are affecting pituitary stalk or hypothalamus. So which will be the hormone that will be most impact? That's what I'm asking. So what is your answer? Some people are answering ACTH. Some people are answering its growth hormone. Some people are answering CADH. We are getting equal uh, like responses to each and every option. So I believe this must be a genuinely confusing question. The right answer for this question is antidiuretic hormone ADH. So because you are affecting the pituitary stalk or you are affecting the hypothalamus. So in that case, you are going to affect the antidiuretic hormone. So for that, you need to understand the basics first. It's very, very important. So how will you classify pituitary hormones in the first place? So pituitary hormones. So if you talk about pituitary per se, you are going to divide pituitary into two. One is called as anterior pituitary and second one is the posterior pituitary. So we know that anterior pituitary is called as adenohypophysis, adenohypophysis and posterior pituitary is also referred to as something called as neurohypophysis, neurohypophysis. Remember the embryology is also very, very different with regards to anterior and posterior pituitary. Video available for download also, we can save. It is available, Dr. Nivasti, I think uh, he has asked that uh, for the third time. So that's telling. it's available in the YouTube all the time. So you can go to the live section of Cerebellum and you can watch that video anytime, anytime you want. So it is there. So this video is available. Okay. Even whatever videos we have done in the past is also available. So no need to worry about that. Okay. All right. So we have something called adenohypophysis and we have something called neurohypophysis that is anterior pituitary and we have something called as posterior pituitary. All right. So where the anterior pituitary is originating from? Anterior pituitary is basically originating from something called as Rathke's pouch. Basically it is coming from ectoderm ectoderm and it is coming from rat case pouch from the pharynx if you look at the embryology whereas where the posterior pituitary is coming from posterior pituitary is actually coming from diencephalon 
Posterior bitter is coming from dynkephalon, which means it's a neuronal structure. Dynkephalon is going to give rise to hypothalamus. Dynkephalon is going to give rise to hypothalamus. And posterior pituitary is a direct extension. Okay, posterior pituitary is a direct extension of hypothalamus. It's a direct extension of hypothalamus, which means it's something like a part of hypothalamus. That is posterior pituitary. Okay, now what are the like cells of anterior pituitary? So in the anterior pituitary, you have two types of cells. One is called as chromophobes. Okay, chromophobes. 50% of the cells are going to be chromophobes and remaining 50% of the cells are chromophils. Okay, these are chromophils. Remaining 50 percentage. So why they are called chromophobes? Because they don't take up the stain. Why they don't take up the stain? Because these are non-secretory. These are non-secretory. They don't secrete. These cells don't secrete anything. What about chromophils? Chromophils are the ones that are secretory. So they are the ones that are going to secrete hormones. They are secretory in nature. That's why they are taking up the stain. That's why it's called chromophils. So based on what stain they take up, you can further classify into acidophils or basophils. Depending on hematoxylin or eosin, which they take up, you can split it into acidophils and you can split it into something called as basophils. Acidophils and basophils. So what are the hormones that are secreted by the acidophils? Acidophils are going to secrete two hormones. Okay, one is going to be the growth hormone, second is going to be the prolactin. One is going to be the growth hormone, second is the prolactin. Understand, this is a very important point. Growth hormone, prolactin, acidophils. What are the hormones secreted by the basophils? ACTH, very important hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And they also secrete another hormone called as POMC. In fact, pre opio melanocortin is the main hormone. ACTH is just a cut part or a split up part of the POMC. In from the big molecule called POMC, if you split up something, that is ACTH. Okay, ACTH or POMC. Second, you are going to secrete something called as TSH. That is thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, or you can call it as thyrotropin. And third one is going to be your G, I mean FSH, gonadotropins. These are nothing but FSH and LH. Follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So these are the hormones secreted by the basophils. So we can understand the mechanism of action also. Can anyone say what are the mechanism of action of acidophilic hormones? How they work? Acidophilic hormones work by JAK-STAT pathway. So what is JAK-STAT? Is nothing but NRTK. NRTK means these are going to work by non-receptor tyrosine kinases. I'll repeat, non-receptor tyrosine kinases. That is nothing but JAK-STAT pathway. That's how acidophilic hormones are going to work. How basophilic hormones are going to work? Basophilic hormones are going to work by G protein coupled receptor pathway. Okay, they're going to work by GPCR pathway. That is G protein coupled receptor. You know what is GPCR? The most common receptor in the body is G protein coupled receptor. Membrane spanning, seven domains. We all know that GPCR. That's how the basophilic hormones are going to work. So in that GS or GQ is a homework for you. So something works by GS type. Something works by GQ type. What works by GS and what works by GQ, you need to find out. So if I, if you do if you want, I will tell at the end of the class. So what works by GS and what works by GQ. But it's all going to work by the common principle of G protein coupled receptor. All right. So this is the uh, hormone secreted by the anterior pituitary. And what about posterior pituitary? Posterior pituitary is going to secrete two hormones. Hormone number one, antidiuretic hormone, otherwise called as vasopressin, or we can write as AVP or arginine vasopressin. Second, we have another hormone called as oxytocin, which is important during labor. We all know that. So these are two hormones. Again, the posterior pituitary hormones, you need to know they are not secreted by any cells in the posterior pituitary. They are direct extension of hypothalamus, which means these are basically hypothalamic hormones. What you need to know is these are basically what? Hypothalamic hormones. Hypothalamic hormones. Whatever is secreted by the hypothalamus is just stored in the posterior pituitary and then it is secreting. So look at the image of the posterior pituitary, I'm um, image of the pituitary. So let us assume this is the anterior pituitary, which basically contains the cells, which basically contains the cells, okay, chromophiles and the chromophobes, and the chromophiles are going to secrete. And if you look at the posterior pituitary, posterior pituitary doesn't contain cells. They contain neurons of the hypothalamus, okay? So if you look at this is the hypothalamus, 
Okay, this is the hypothalamus. And from the hypothalamus, there's going to be some neurons that are going to enter the posterior pituitary and the hormones are just stored here and that is secreted directly into the circulation. So basically these are nothing but axons or neurons of the hypothalamus. So which means ADH and oxytocin are directly secreted by the hypothalamus and stored and released into the posterior pituitary. That's why posterior pituitary is called as neurohypophysis, which means it's a direct extension of hypothalamus, which is a neuronal structure. Whereas anterior pituitary contains cells, okay, the acidophils and the basophils, they are the ones that are going to secrete. But hypothalamus is only going to control the secretions of the anterior pituitary. How they are going to control? Again, through certain neurons, okay, that are going to not enter the anterior pituitary, rather they will end up in an area called as median eminence. I'll repeat, it'll end up in an area called as median eminence. It's not going to come all the way down to the anterior pituitary. They're going to release their factors. It could be stimulating factor or it could be inhibiting factors. They're going to release at the median eminence. Then how does this come into the anterior pituitary? That is why we have something called as portal system. What is portal system? So in our body, Normally, from artery, you enter capillaries. From capillaries, you enter veins. This is a normal circulation. From veins, it's going to come back to the capillary arteries again through heart and other circulatory system. This is normal. But portal system is something different. From arteries, you enter capillaries. From capillaries, you enter veins. From veins, you enter another set of capillaries. Okay, these are called as sinusoids sometimes. And from capillaries, you get another venous system. And from there, it comes back to the arteries which means this additional veno-venous communication. Okay, this is what we call it as portal system. That addition is what we call it as portal system. Best example is liver. What happens in the liver? You initially start with your uh, gut circulation, celiac artery, superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery. That enter, uh, that ends up with the mesenteric capillaries. And from the mesenteric capillaries, you enter the portal vein. From the portal vein, you enter liver sinusoids. They break up again in the liver. From the liver sinusoids, you form hepatic vein and IVC. So that's why this is a portal system. Okay, this is a portal system. So mesenteric arteries to mesenteric capillaries from that portal vein in the liver, they break up, break down again. That is sinusoids and then you go back again. That's what we call as portal. I, I mean, go back again to hepatic vein and IVC. This veno-venous communication is portal system. Same thing is going to happen in the anterior pituitary. What's going to happen in the anterior pituitary? So you're going to have the superior hypophyseal artery. So this is an artery, superior hypophyseal artery. Okay, they're going to break up into capillaries. Okay, they're going to break up into capillaries. Where? Exactly in the median eminence. They're going to break up into capillaries. And that those capillaries are going to become veins. And they're going to carry whatever factors that are released by hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary. And now in the anterior pituitary, they form another capillary plexus. Capillaries, veins. Again, you are going to split into capillary plexus. Then finally, it becomes a superior hypophyseal vein. So now you get the venous system. So you can see you have capillary breakdown, veins, and then capillaries, then veins. So this additional veno-venous system is what we call it as portal system. So this is also an example of portal system. And that's why we are going to call this as hypothalamo. So why hypothalamo? Because it enters the median lens of the hypothalamus. Then it comes back to the anterior pituitary, hypophyseal portal system. I think you can understand now. So what do you mean by hypothalamo, hypophyseal portal system? Are you understanding? Hypothalamo, hypophyseal portal system. Enter hypothalamus, break down into capillaries, veins again, come back to the anterior pituitary, form capillaries again, then form veins again. That's why it's a portal system. What portal? Hypothalamo, hypophyseal portal system. So in the anterior pituitary, this portal system is the one that's going to carry the factors of the hypothalamus. For example, hypothalamus can secrete a lot of factors that control the anterior pituitary. Like for example, growth hormone releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. Likewise, you're going to have plenty of factors and it could be stimulating or inhibitory factors that are going to be released by the hypothalamus that will come to the median eminence. From there, it's going to be washed out by the portal system, which is going to bring all the 
factors released by the hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary where they exert their effects on the cells of the anterior pituitary. That's why it is called as hypothalamo hypovisceral portal system. For posterior pituitary, there is no portal system that is required because the hypothalamic neurons directly enter the posterior pituitary. So you are not going to have any much effect. Actually, I mean, there is no need of portal system in the first place because it's just the neurons that are entering the posterior pituitary. So technically, you have an area of the pituitary called as the stalk. The stalk. The stalk of the posterior pituitary. I mean, stalk of the pituitary. So what are going to form the stalk of the pituitary? So there are two things that are going to form the stalk of the pituitary. One, a part of anterior pituitary. Second, a part of posterior pituitary also. A part of hypothalamus, I would say. So number one, anterior pituitary is divided into three. Pars distalis. Okay. Pars tuberalis and in the posterior part of the pars that is anterior pituitary so in that the pars tuberalis part the pars tuberalis is going to start forming the stalk and the part of the hypothalamus is also going to form the stalk so in case if you're going to damage the stalk okay in case if you're going to damage the stalk what is going to happen you are going to first damage the uh, uh, hormones that are released by the hypothalamus or if you're going to damage the hypothalamus first what you're going to affect you're going to affect the adh and the oxytocin so when you are damaging the pituitary stalk the first hormone that will be affected is the hormones that are directly secreted by the hypothalamus on the other hand if you're damaging the hypothalamus first again those that are secreted directly by the hypothalamus will be affected first that is why if at all you are damaging the stalk of the posterior pituitary, stalk of the pituitary or if you're damaging the hypothalamus directly you are going to affect ADH first, antidiuretic hormone first. That is why anything that causes involvement of the stalk. So what is the usual condition that involves the stalk? Infiltrating disorders. Infiltrating disorders. So what are infiltrating disorders? Like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, metastasis to the pituitary. So these are infiltrating disorders. Infiltrating disorders first involve the stalk. They tend to produce stalk thickening. So because of the stalk infiltration, one of the first things that occurs in any infiltrative disorders like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis or metastasis, metastasis to the pituitary is diabetes insipidus. That is because of ADH deficiency. When ADH deficiency is causing diabetes insipidus, that is called as central diabetes insipidus. You know that. That's called a central diabetes insipidus. That is not apoplexy. That is central diabetes insipidus. Infiltrating condition affecting the stalk causing ADH deficiency first. It is central diabetes insipidus. Okay. This is the concept behind. So you can understand this much, much better now. So you are correct. In certain people, certain people said growth hormone will be affected first. To some extent, it's correct, but it's not due to hypothalamic or stalk damage. Rather, growth hormone will be first affected in ischemia to the pituitary or in radiation induced damage okay in radiation induced damage okay that's going to affect the growth hormone first first growth hormone will be affected in ischemia or any trauma okay growth hormone will be affected i'll come back because you have a question dr ram nemela is asking about what is apoplexy you have a question on that i'll explain the concept of apoplexy in some time Okay, now understand in these conditions, the growth hormone is affected first. Why growth hormone is affected first in these conditions? For that, you need to know the distribution of cells in the anterior pituitary. So what, how about the distribution of cells? Let us assume this is the anterior pituitary and this is the posterior pituitary. We are not talking about posterior pituitary. So this posterior section and this entire section is the anterior pituitary. In the anterior pituitary, where will be the growth? I mean, where will be the location of the growth hormone producing cells and prolactins? I mean, prolactin producing cells. It will be on the side. It will be on the lateral part. So in the anterolateral region, in the anterolateral region, okay, anterolateral region, you are going to have growth hormone secreting cells and prolactin secreting cells. In the center, okay, in the center, you are going to have TSH producing cells, okay, and even going deeper you are going to have ACTH producing cells. You are going to have ACTH producing cells. So just look at the anatomy and say, if I am going to traumatize the pituitary, anterior pituitary, which will be affected first? Tell me. 
in ischemia, trauma or any radiation related injury when a traumatizing from outside, which cells will be first affected? Of course, you know, the lateral, the outermost, the peripheral part will be the ones that will be first affected, isn't it? So that is the reason why whenever there is ischemia or whenever there is radiotherapy or whenever there is trauma to the pituitary, the first hormone that will be affected is always almost going to be the growth hormone. Of course, prolactin is also important, but growth hormone is more important. Which will be affected late. Remember the ACTH because it's most central. It is most deeper. That's the reason why ACTH will be involved last in these conditions. There are exceptions, but in these conditions, generally ACTH will be involved last because it's deeper. But growth hormone and prolactin will be involved in the growth hormone. That's the most important. That will be involved first because it's more lateral, more peripheral, easy to insult. And where, where are the gonadotropins? Okay, FSH and LH producing. They, they are scattered everywhere. They are scattered everywhere. It's not like they have a set location anteriority. So the gonadotropin producing cells are located everywhere. So basically, growth hormone producing cells are called as somatotrophs. Prolactin producing cells are called as lactotrophs. TSH producing cells are called as thyrotrophs. ACTH producing cells are called as corticotrophs. And gonadotropin FSH LH producing cells are called as gonadotrophs. Okay. So growth hormone will be affected first. But ADH will be affected first in case of stark injury. In case of stark injury or direct injury to hypothalamus, ACTH is the one that will be affected first. Sorry, ADH, antidiuretic hormone will be affected first. So there is something called as stark effect. So what is stark effect? They might ask you what happens if there is a complete transection of the stark. Complete transection of pituitary stark. Complete transection, which means you have completely cut the pituitary stock. That's what we call it as stock effect. So what will happen? In this condition, you will lose all the post pituitary hormones and all the anti pituitary hormones are also going to come down. So growth hormone levels will decrease. Your TSH levels will decrease. You are going to have reduction in the gonadotropins also, FSH and LH, and there will be reduction in ADH and oxytocin release also, but only one hormone actually increases. What is that hormone? That hormone is prolactin. Okay, prolactin alone will increase. Every other hormone will basically decrease. What is the reason for this increase in the prolactin? Because prolactin is controlled by an inhibiting factor called as dopamine. We all know that growth hormone is controlled by growth hormone releasing hormone. And growth hormone is also controlled by somatostatin to some extent. Somatostatin is basically going to inhibit the growth hormone release, whereas growth hormone releasing hormone is going to activate the growth hormone release. We all know that. Basically, prolactin is going to be controlled by an inhibiting factor that is called as dopamine. This pathway is called as tuberoinfundibular pathway. Everyone knows that. So there are three pathways for dopamine in the brain. One is called as your... Uh, uh, it's coming from the midbrain. Okay, two pathways will actually come from the midbrain. Okay, so both are mesencephalic pathways. One goes to the cortex and second goes to the basal ganglia. So what is that basal ganglia pathway called as? Nigrostriel pathway. And second pathway goes from midbrain to the cortex, multiple places, to the limbic system and the cortex, where it controls our emotions, addiction behavior and our cognition. That's another pathway. And the third pathway is tuberoinfundibular pathway. So that is what is controlling the prolactin release from the anterior pituitary. So dopamine. So who is controlling the ACTH and POMC secretion? It is corticotropin releasing hormone. Who is controlling TSH? TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Who is going to uh, control the uh, FSH and LH? It is the gonadotropin releasing hormone. So yes, that's correct. Many people are answering three pathways. Nigros trial to basal ganglia, then from midbrain to cortex and limbic system, mesolimbic and mesocortical, and third pathway is going to be your tuberoinfundibular pathway. So here we are talking about tuberoinfundibular pathway that controls the prolactin release from the anterior period. So this is the entire nutshell that we need to talk about. And at what radiation doses? So I told you radiotherapy. So radiotherapy is going to affect definitely your pituitary. But how long radiotherapy takes? Radiotherapy doesn't affect the anterior pituitary hormones that easily. Radiotherapy will take a lot of time 
to involve the antiripatory uh, hormones. How long it takes? Generally, it takes around 4 to 5 years. It takes more than 4 to 5 years to cause hypopituitarism. It will not cause immediate damage. After 4 to 5 years only, the manifestations will start with radiotherapy. That is the reason why pituitary radiotherapy is not a very good option for emergency control of hormone output from a tumor. If I am going to have a pituitary tumor and I am having hyperpituitarism, secreting more hormones from the tumor, radiotherapy is not a very good option to immediately control the hormone output. That is why radiotherapy is the third line option. You do not use radiotherapy as a first line. First line option first is going to be either drugs or surgery depending on the tumor that you are going to look at. Either going to use surgery like transvenoidal surgery are going to use some drugs to control the hormone output. So it takes 4 to 5 years to damage. At what doses? What effect? Less, see which is more uh, uh, like susceptible to radiation induced injury? It is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is more susceptible than pituitary for radiation related injuries. Pituitary is quite resistant honestly. Hypothalamus is more susceptible to radiation induced damage. So depending on the dose of radiation, if it is less than 12 grays of radiation, usually you will not get any effect. No effect. Okay, beyond 12 to 18 grays. So what will be the first will be affected? You are going to answer. What is the first will be affected? Hormones, radiation induced damage after 12 to 18 grays. Beyond 12 to 18 grays, what will be the first that will be affected? Which hormone? Which cells are susceptible? More peripheral. Growth hormone. Okay, that's the one that will be affected after 12 to 18 grays. After 24 grays, beyond 24 grays of radiation, not ADH. ADH is going to be due to stark effect. I told you so many times, ADH is due to stark effect. Radiation, trauma, ischemia, first thing is always growth hormone. I told you so many times, growth hormone. More than 24 grays, you are going to cause ACTH deficiency. And more than 30 grays, you will start producing gonadotropin and TSH deficiency. So generally, the ACTH, gondotropin and TSH will be quite resistant. First growth hormone will be affected, then only others will be affected. So beyond 30 grays, you will result in something called as MPHD. What is MPHD? Multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, which means not only growth hormone, other hormones also will become deficient beyond 30 grays of radiation. So first growth hormone will be affected. So that starts getting affected by more than 12 to 18 grays. See, we are talking about cranial radiation. Why you wanted to get concerned about your gonads now. Yes, gonads are very susceptible to radiation induced damage but we are talking about radiation to the cranium because of some brain tumors or for pituitary radiation directly. In that instant of cranial radiation, what is the first that will be affected? Less than 12 gray does not affect anything. Okay, Less than 12 gray of radiation will not cause any much major issues at all in the first place. So you can be sure about that. After 12 grays only you are going to affect uh, hormones. Some hormones you will be affecting. Most importantly, first will be growth hormone and you have to know that hypothalamus is more susceptible to radiation induced damage compared to that of pituitary. So I think all of these concepts are very very important to answer. Hypothalamus is more susceptible to radiation. Yes, but who is controlling the antiperitary hormones? Dr. Meet Patel is asking hypothalamus is more susceptible but who is controlling the antiperitary hormones? Hypothalamus. When hypothalamus is affected, Obviously, your antiperitary hormones are going to get affected. That is what I have told here. Basically, if hypothalamus is affected, your antiperitary hormones is also going to be affected. There is no doubt about that. Okay, I think you can understand what I am trying to say. So now, we have discussed so much of concepts in depth. So if you are going to look at one more time, whatever I have discussed, you will understand it much beautifully. So that is enough. Okay, so I think Dr. Avinash is also asking the same question, but I have explained already. Hypothalamus after it means you are going to invariably affect the antiperitary hormones only. What is the problem in that? Okay, now going to the next question. Question number two. A 45 year old man reports coarsening of his facial features over several years. In addition, he reports low libido and decreased energy. Physical examination shows frontal bossing and enlarged hands. Which of the following screening tests should be ordered? You are going to order 24 hour urinary free cortisol or serum ACTH or fasting growth hormone levels or serum IGF-1. Which of the following screening tests should be ordered? This is a very very common question asked in many of your exams. Okay, it's simple. So the diagnosis here is straightforward. It is acromegaly. Acromegaly. 
so the first line investigation okay the first investigation or the screening investigation of choice screening investigation of choice is going to be serum igf1 level so the right answer is d it's very simple how you are going to evaluate a case of acromegaly so if you suspect acromegaly the first step is serum igf1 uh, needless to say that everyone will be knowing that the features of acromegaly are coarsening of facial features frontal bossing squaring of the mandible dental malocclusion because enlargement of the maxilla and the mandible then patients will have big hands large hands increase in the soft tissues of the hand and feet so there will be increased heel pad thickness and patients will have uh, increase in the ring size and the shoe size so these are all some of the important features patients can also develop diabetes hypertension lvh left ventricular hypertrophy and cardiomyopathy patients can develop thyromegaly renomegaly there are plenty of features that you can get with growth hormone excess okay so whenever the serum i mean whenever you suspect acromegaly because of the external features in exam it will be very clear most of the times you're going to do serum igf1 as the first test if you suspect acromegaly it's the screening test if serum igf1 is normal then it rules out acromegaly okay it's unlikely it's not growth hormone excess if the serum igf1 levels are increased it's a non-specific investigation so you have to confirm how to confirm you are going to do something called 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test you are going to use the same test that you are going to use for confirming diabetes 75 gram OGTT if the 75 gram OGTT shows a good growth hormone suppression if the growth hormone levels are suppressed okay if it reduces then it in it rules out growth hormone deficiency if the growth hormone levels are not suppressed if the levels are still detectable if you use older assays the cutoff is 0.4 if you use modern assays, the cutoff is 0.1 nanogram per ml. It depends on what assay you use. In our hospital, we use modern assays. So in our hospital, the cutoff is 0.1. In older assays, the cutoff is 0.4. But what you need to know is after giving glucose also, if the growth hormone is not suppressed, persistently high, then it confirms it is growth hormone excess. It is confirms its growth hormone excess. So now if you know the moment you know it's a growth hormone excess, next step is to localize where the problem is. Now it's better to do MRI pituitary. MRI of the pituitary. You know what kind of MRI you are going to do? You are going to do something called as dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. Dynamic contrast enhanced MRI to see the tumors in the pituitary. So you are going to do MRI with pituitary focus. If the MRI shows a mass, okay, if the MRI shows a mass, in the pituitary then it confirms it is pituitary adenoma otherwise called as somatotroph adenoma pituitary adenoma or somatotroph adenoma if the mri of the pituitary is normal if it doesn't show a mass then it could be a possible ectopic growth hormone or growth hormone releasing hormone secretion this is very very rare okay next step will be to do a fdg pet fdg pet you are going to do a fluorodeoxyglucose pet scan or alternatively you can do a cct of the chest and the abdomen also or you can do a whole body FDG PET also, not a problem. So this is very rare possibility ectopic. More than 95% of the times, more than 95% of the times, the cause of growth hormone excess will be a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma or otherwise called as somatotroph adenoma. This is the reason for growth hormone excess in more than 95% of the cases in the world. Ectopic is rare. If at all it's an ectopic, what are the possible sources? Number one, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms. Some pancreatic tumors can secrete growth hormone releasing hormone or very rarely growth hormone itself, but commonly they secrete growth hormone releasing hormone. Second, it could be medullary thyroid cancer. These are the two things that you need to know. Small cell lung cancer rarely produces growth hormone releasing hormone, but these are the two tumors that commonly produces growth hormone releasing hormone or very rarely growth hormone. So pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms and medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, this is what you need to know. So you are going to do basically a PET CT as the next step. So this is how you are going to evaluate a growth hormone excess or suspected patient of acromegaly. So how you are going to manage pituitary adenoma treatment. So the first choice is going to be transphenoidal surgery. The first choice is transphenoidal surgery. Remember in prolactin secreting adenomas. Prolactinomas first choice is Cabergolin or bromocryptin if the patient is pregnant or patient is desiring pregnancy then bromocryptin. Otherwise the first choice for prolactinomas is cabergolin. But for growth hormone secreting pituitary adenomas the first choice itself is transphenoidal surgery. Why? Growth hormone excess is associated with increased mortality. Growth hormone is associated with 
increased mortality. Okay, it's associated with increased mortality. In fact, two times increased mortality and the most common cause of death due to growth hormone excess, most common cause of death due to growth hormone excess is cardiovascular death, like MI heart failure and all. CV death is the most common cause of death due to growth hormone excess. So what are the problems, complications of growth hormone excess? Main complications, apart from the physical disfiguration that the patient develops, they can develop diabetes, they can develop hypertension, and they can develop um, increased cardiovascular risk, okay, and they can develop obstructive sleep apnea because of pharyngeal tissue hypertrophy, and they can develop left ventricular hypertrophy, which means they can develop cardiomyopathy also, and more importantly, many people don't understand the fact that they tend to produce colonic polyps and they can increase the risk of colon cancer also. This is the gold standard point that I want to say. People who are having growth hormone excess are at risk of developing certain cancers, but the most important for exams is going to be the colon cancer. Okay, very, very important. Okay, these are the problems. That is the reason why growth hormone excess is associated with high mortality. That's why we are going to do surgery as the first choice. You have to eradicate the tumor as soon as possible. Surgery gives you 60% cure rates. Approximately 40 to 60%, but you can roughly take it as 60% cure rate. So one third to two third of the patients can be cured from the disease after surgery. If the surgery has failed, what is the second choice? Second choice will be drugs, okay, medical therapy. So what are the medical therapy? You can try somatostatin receptor agonist. So what are the somatostatin receptor agonists? Yeah, what are the somatostatin receptor agonists? We have octreotide. We have octreotide. HNPCC association is present or not? No, 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 no. There is no relationship with HNPCC. Don't worry about that. HNPCC is a different disease altogether. That is due to microsatellite instability and that's due to uh, MSH1, MSH2, MLH5 mutation. So that is different. That's MSH. That's the hallmark. Octreotide. And we have something called landriotide. Any one of these drugs can be asked. And we have something called as passeriotide. Passeriotide. Okay, so these are the somatostatin receptor agonists. Or we can use growth hormone receptor antagonists. So what is the growth hormone receptor antagonist? That's called as pegvisomant. Pegvisomant. Okay, growth hormone receptor antagonist. That's called as pegvisomant. So these are the drugs that are going to be effective. And apart from that, if it's still not controlled, third line is going to be radiotherapy of the radiotherapy to the pituitary. But this is a slow process and a painstakingly slow process. Dopamine is cabergolin. Somebody is commenting about cabergolin. But remember, previously itself we discussed that uh, both, both growth hormone and prolactin are coming from acerophils, which means both growth hormone producing cells and prolactin producing cells, that is lactotrophs, have a common origin. So many times, uh, somatotroph adenomas can have prolactin co-secretion. If at all they have prolactin co-secretion, okay, if at all they have prolactin co-secretion, then dopamine receptor agonists like cabergolin or bromocryptin may be effective. If there is a prolactin co-secretion, then dopamine receptor agonists can be helpful like bromocryptin or cabergolin. Dr. Vajit Khan is telling, please improve handwriting. This is the best handwriting. Basically, I'm a consulting physician, man. So this is the best handwriting I can ever get, honestly speaking. I don't know. So I'll try to improve my handwriting anyways. I think people can understand, right? So I have written in a very nice way only, as far as I know. Okay, compared to, I mean, that's the reason why I don't uh, write prescriptions nowadays. It's all EMR. It's electronic medical records only. Just I type, take a printout and give because of the same reason. So anyways, I'll try to improve my handwriting. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Okay. So first step is transvenal surgery. Second step is drugs. Third step is going to be pituitary radiotherapy. Okay. But it's a very slow process. So it's going to be like very slow. It's going to take a long time to control the hormone output. So this is not for immediate control of hormone output. Okay. So going to the question number three. So this question, you know, very well now. So going to the question number three. So it's an interesting question. So 28 year old woman presents to the emergency room with severe headache and visual disturbances. HCT revealed a 3 cm cellar mass as well as intralesional hyperdensities. Cellar mass with intralesional hyperdensities. On examination, temperature is 37.5 degrees Celsius, which is almost normal. 
heart rate is 100 per minute 100 beats per minute bp is 90 upon 60 borderline hypotension respiratory rate 22 breaths per minute sodium 132 potassium 4.2 creatinine 0.8 what is the next best step in management okay administer hydrocortisone assessment of tft and adh refer for mri with pituitary protocol that is dynamic contrast enhanced mri and refer for neurosurgical consultation what is the right answer for this so what are you going to do okay first of all what is the diagnosis here patient is coming with severe headache and visual disturbances patient is having a cellar mass with intralesional hyperdensity that's the clue it's not Sheehan syndrome. Here the diagnosis is pituitary apoplexy. Remember, apoplexy is different from Sheehan syndrome. Here the diagnosis is pituitary apoplexy. It is not Sheehan's. What is apoplexy? Apoplexy usually occurs due to an underlying pituitary adenoma. So generally there will be a macroadenoma. There will be a history of pituitary macroadenoma that many times screws up its own blood supply because of screwing up of your uh, of, of its own blood supply it results in hemorrhage hemorrhage into the macroadenoma that hemorrhage into the macroadenoma is the one we are going to call it as pituitary apoplexy so what occurs this hemorrhage is going to suddenly increase the size suddenly increase the size of the pituitary because sudden increase the size of the pituitary and the tumor sudden increase the size of the pituitary and the tumor Okay, sudden increase in size of the pituitary and the size of the tumor is going to result in raised intracranial pressure. Because of raised ICP, sudden increase, you don't have adaptation. So patient is going to present with headache. Patient is going to present with headache. Patient is going to have nausea vomiting because of raised ICP. And patients can even have altered mental status. Patients can have altered mental status. Okay. So that is why here the history is very clear and of course with this sudden increase in size of the pituitary is going to result in compression of the optic chiasma. It's not only going to raise the ICP, this sudden increase in size is also going to compress optic chiasma because we know pituitary is present in the cella tersica. We know pituitary is present in the cella tersica. And on top of that you are having the optic nerve, especially the optic chiasma is just above. And here is the cavernous sinus. In the cavernous sinus what you have? Of course, you have internal carotid artery. Apart from that, you have so many nerves like 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, 2, 6, 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, 2, 6. Very important. Third nerve, fourth nerve, 5, 1, ophthalmic, 5, 2, maxillary, 6, abducens. All these nerves are in the cavernous sinus only. So, this sudden expansion of the pituitary is going to result in compression of optic chiasma. This will result in visual field defects, typically bitemporal hemianopia. And this can compress on the cranial nerves in the cavernous sinus causing cranial nerve palsy also. If possible, that can also occur. So here the patient is presenting with headache and patient presenting with visual disturbances. And clearly in the CT you are seeing a 3 cm cellar mass. It's a macro or micro adenoma. Macro or micro adenoma. 3 cm cellar mass. 3 cm. Macro or micro. It's a macro adenoma. I told you most of the times apoplexy occurs in the background of macro adenoma. So it's a macro adenoma with intralesional hyperdensities, which means this indicates hemorrhage. Okay, hemorrhage. In the plain CT, if you see white, white spots, in the plain CT, if you see white, white spots, white, white spots, that indicates hemorrhage. That, that is nothing but intralesional hyperdensity. That is hemorrhage. So this clearly tells hemorrhage into the pituitary and that hemorrhage into the pituitary is what we call it as pituitary apoplexy. It is an endocrinological emergency. It's a macroadenoma is more than one centimeter. Everyone knows that's an endocrinological emergency because apart from causing all these problems. Okay, so in this pituitary, they can produce visual field defects and they can produce cranial palsies also apart from Interactional hyperdensity is actually hemorrhage, not calcification. Okay, it's hemorrhage, acute hemorrhage. If you want, you can compare the Hounsfield units with that of the bone. You will see whether it is calcium or blood. That is easy in the radiology department to confirm. So that's not a problem. Anyways, so, so what is going to happen? It's also going to result in multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies because it's going to damage the pituitary, especially the anterior pituitary, and it's going to cause multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies, MPHD, 
you know if i suddenly lose growth hormone as an adult i'm not going to have any problem much of a problem hemorrhage is not present in chihans i'll come back to the chihans is different so if i lose growth hormone i don't have any problem if i'm going to lose uh, maybe prolactin as an adult i don't have any problem if i'm going to lose tsh it's going to have a long term effects acutely i'm not going to have any problem if i lose tsh if i lose fsh and lh it's not life threatening i might have gonadal dysfunction that is going to be a long term problem that also not going to bother me but what is going to bother me is the acth loss is the acth deficiency that's going to bother me because this is a life saving hormone this is going to reduce the cortisol output from the adrenal gland and that is going to result in shock and hyponatremia shock and hyponatremia right that's going to result in shock and hyponatremia because this is a life saving hormone growth hormone is not life saving prolactin is not life saving your fsh and lh is not life saving tsh is not life saving unless until it's extreme deficiency or extreme excess but cortisol is deficiency of cortisol result in shock addison in crisis and i can result in hyponatremia that is what the patient is having this patient is having hypotension 90 60 in emergency 90 60 is always low if i see that in the opd well patient sitting in front of me talking well 90 60 i won't bother but if the patient is in emergency 90 60 is low it's a pre shock state then low sodium hyponatremia clear remember only primary adrenal in insufficiency if the damage is in the adrenal gland you will have hyperkalemia otherwise you will not have hyperkalemia because this is a pituitary problem in pituitary problem the aldosterone levels will be normal so that will not cause hyperkalemia you will result only in hyponatremia this is a very very important point okay that's what is happening clear so very simple so this is a case of macroadenoma causing apoplexy and you are having uh, acth deficiency and because of that you are in a pre shock state so what you are going to do administer hydrocortisone as the next step because this is a life saving therapy so they are asking next best step in the management administer hydrocortisone correct the shock you can do this later on you can do this also later on you can do this also later on no problem but all these are important but you can do later on not urgent this is urgent otherwise the patient will enter shock and they will die and many people are getting confused with chihan syndrome because the problem is people think like chihan syndrome and apoplexy are one and the same no chihan syndrome and apoplexy are very very different apoplexy is hemorrhage into the pituitary due to any cause the most common cause is macroadenoma screwing up its own blood supply but it could be due to massive severe hypertension or it could be due to anticoagulant use or dic there are other causes but the most common cause is macroadenoma chihan syndrome okay that is different this is postpartum pituitary necrosis postpartum pituitary necrosis obstructive or hypolemic shock why there should be an obstructive shock here it's an hypolemic shock okay it is not an obstructive shock in i mean many times there will be a combined hypolemic and distributive shock in adrenal insufficiency it's not just a pure hypolemic it, there could be a distributive component also whenever there is a adrenal insufficiency but that's too much of a ask can we give acth see why you want to use acth which is very costly see even if you give acth it's going to act in the adrenal gland and it's going to release cortisol so directly give cortisol what is cortisol hydrocortisone hydrocortisone is a pharmacological cortisol that's all your adrenal secrete cortisol from outside you're giving hydrocortisone same why you want to give acth what is the reason why you want to give acth i don't understand many people are asking the same question there is no need okay so chihan syndrome is nothing but postpartum pituitary necrosis so what will be the clue here most of the cases will be quiescent they will be totally asymptomatic okay there won't be any problem at all no headache no nausea vomiting no raised icp features no visual field defects no cranial nerve palsies okay so what is the problem patient will be completely asymptomatic because here the problem is like severe pph that is causing pituitary necrosis what will be the clue in exam history of multiple blood transfusions history of multiple blood transfusions this is a very very important clue even some uh, guidelines define how much blood transfusion should be there but history of multiple blood transfusions is equal to severe postpartum hemorrhage but patients will be totally asymptomatic 
only one symptom that the patient can have is lactational failure is lactational failure lactational failure that's what are going to have so tell me one thing we have seen in the first question itself i told you in ischemia in ischemia to the pituitary what is the first hormone to be affected in ischemia to the pituitary what is the first hormone will be affected growth hormone so growth hormone deficiency is not going to produce any much problem in adult patients as such then after growth hormone what will be affected tell me which is more peripheral which is more peripheral after growth hormone what will be affected after growth hormone what will be affected prolactin this also peripheral okay after growth hormone so prolactin deficiency will be very common but the thing is like in adults like for example if i am going to have deficiency in prolactin i'm not going to lose anything because prolactin is not very much important for me as that to as a male and adult for whom prolactin is more important prolactin is going to be more important for postpartum women so first for these in shehan syndrome also first hormone to decrease is growth hormone i don't disagree with that even in shehan syndrome the first hormone to decrease is growth hormone but that's not going to cause any much symptoms so what's going to cause symptoms is prolactin deficiency because in postpartum period lactation is a very important process if that is lost there will be lactation failure so that will be the clue totally asymptomatic patient lactation failure subacute presentation otherwise no complications that is shehan syndrome acth deficiency usually is very very rare in shehan syndrome i'll repeat acth deficiency is very rare in shehan syndrome you don't develop acth deficiency that easily in shehan syndrome so giving hydrocortisone is not that important if acth is deficient then you can maybe replace cortisol otherwise it's not required so prolactin deficiency otherwise don't produce any problem so this is something that can be treated very very conservatively if you suspect other hormone deficiencies then you can evaluate and you can replace that particular hormone whatever is deficient otherwise this much is enough for shehan syndrome so what you can see here is that apoplexy and shehan syndrome are totally different entities i think you can get it okay apoplexy and shehan syndrome are basically totally different tsh deficiency yes can be seen see other hormone deficiencies can be seen okay like tsh deficiency can be there hdh deficiency also can be there but you have to work up for that but that's not very common but so you have to work up see the deficiency confirm it then you can replace that hormone in case if it's deficient but this is the clue in exam that much is enough lactation failure that's the clue treatment is more conservative it's not an endocrine emergency anymore apoplexy is it's an emergency you have to treat immediately you have to refer to neurosurgery as soon as possible i think you can get okay now coming to question number 4 many people have been asking about why do you give steroids in shehan usually it's not required again give steroids in shehan only if you suspect acth deficiency if the patient is having low bp or uh, patient is having hyponatremia then in the presence of shehan syndrome you can give hydrocortisone otherwise it's not required okay so which of the following is not seen in men one so many people have been asking about men one uh, syndrome and uh, about men syndromes which is not seen in men one possibility tumors forget carcinoids then uh, parathyroid hyperplasia and angiofibromas this is actually a direct question from 2020 aims exam 2020 or 2019 something like that i'm not very sure but it's an initiatic question so which of the following is not seen in men one syndrome so many people are answering b some people are answering a some people are answering d the right answer for this is a posterior pituitary tumors that is something that is not seen in men one syndrome so why that is an important point because look at your anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary sir so which is having cells basically so which is having cells basically your anterior pituitary is having cells or posterior pituitary is having cells anterior pituitary is having cells or posterior pituitary are having cells even even if you don't know anything you can answer this question it's pretty simple it is the anterior pituitary that contains cells posterior pituitary doesn't have cells okay so in case if there is going to be a tumor it can be a tumor of the anterior pituitary only because that's the one that contains the chromophiles chromophobes and all that's the one that can produce tumors how can you get tumors from the posterior pituitary where you don't have cells you have just neurons from the hypothalamus 
okay even if you don't know what's happening in men one you can still answer this question pretty easily just by using common sense and some of the questions in exam will be like that only just use your common sense right so the right answer is posterior tumors all others are seen in patients with men one so how will you differentiate different types of men syndrome so you have men one syndrome you have men 2a syndrome okay and you have men 2b syndrome men 2b syndrome how to differentiate it's pretty much simple just write along with me put five tumors first one is pituitary adenoma okay second one is pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms third one right parathyroid adenoma or parathyroid hyperplasia that's going to cause hyperparathyroidism and fourth one is medullary thyroid uh, cancer and fifth one is pheochromocytoma pheochromocytoma okay that's it so what about pituitary adenoma seen in men 1 not seen in men 2a not seen in men 2b what is pancreatic neuronic neoplasm seen in men 1 not seen in men 2a not seen in men 2b what about parathyroid adenomas seen in men 1 seen in men 2a also sometimes not seen in men 2b what about medullary thyroid cancer seen in men sorry not seen in men 1 but seen in men 2a and men 2b what about pheochromocytomas it is not seen in men 1 but seen in men 2a and men 2b okay that's all if you know this that is enough this is the most important table i want to say so all of the men syndromes are autosomal dominant in inheritance all of the men syndrome are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion men 1 is due to mutations of the men gene that is present in chromosome number 11 which is basically a tumor suppressor gene i'll repeat this is a tumor suppressor gene men 1 it produces a protein called as menin protein that is going to inhibit the uh, pa3k akt pathway i'll repeat that's going to inhibit the pa3k akt pathway and the phospholipase c gamma protein kinase pathway it is basically a tumor suppressor protein menin protein men 2a and men 2b on the other hand okay men 2a and men 2b on the other hand is due to red protoncogen mutation red the name itself says t it's in chromosome number 10 red protoncogen it is not a tumor suppressor gene rather it's a proto oncogene it's a proto oncogene okay so men 2a men 2b now what are the other features other features men 1 also tends to produce angiofibromas in fact one of the most common extra endocrine feature of men 1 is angiofibroma most common extra endocrine feature the same adenoma sebaceum like picture that you see in tuber sclerosis that can be seen in men 1 angiofibroma same thing like tuber sclerosis adenoma sebaceum second you can see something else also that is foregut carcinoid why this point is important what is the usual location of carcinoid in the gut what is the most common location of carcinoid tumor in the gut mid gut appendix and the distal ileum but men one syndrome patients tend to develop foregut carcinoids that's very important they can develop gastric thymic or bronchial carcinoid these are foregut structures that's an important point in sporadic carcinoids in general public you get mid gut carcinoids commonly appendix and ileum but in men syndrome foregut carcinoids these are very important but apart from that they can develop collagenomas lipomas so many other tumors they can develop which is not important and what about your men 2a syndrome men 2a has two other subdivisions one is called as fmtc that's called familial medullary thyroid cancer where the patient will have only mtc no other feature of men 2a that's called fmtc second they are associated with skin problem called as cutaneous lichen amyloidosis i'll repeat cutaneous lichen amyloidosis or they will give some lichenoid plaques in the skin especially in the intrascapular region in the back of the patient cutaneous lichen amyloidosis skin feature apart from that they can also have another feature called as hirschsprung disease so men 2a is associated with something called as hirschsprung disease this can be associated with men 2b also but men 2a is more important hirschsprung disease congenital megacolon then what about men 2b men 2b is associated with 2ms that is morphonoid body habitus and mucosal neuromas morphonoid body habitus and mucosal neuromas so trust me the mucosal neuromas are very very important because this has almost a 100% incidence the most common extra endocrine manifestation of men 2b is mucosal neuromas almost 100% without this it's very difficult to diagnose men 2b in the first place okay 
So what is the most common manifestation of MEN1? Most common manifestation of MEN1 is pituitary adenoma. Most common. And the most common tumor is prolactinoma. The most common manifestation, I mean, uh, the most common cause of death rather, sorry, most common manifestation is parathyroid adenoma. Okay. I thought it's parathyroid. So most common manifestation of MEN1 syndrome is parathyroid adenoma where they are going to produce hyperparathyroidism that is primary hyperparathyroidism and you are going to result in hypercalcemia. That is the most common manifestation of MEN1. Pituitary adenoma, the most common pituitary adenoma is prolactinoma. Okay, prolactinoma is the most common pituitary tumor. And the most common cause of death in MEN1 syndrome is pantidic neuroendocrine neoplasm. Most common cause of death in MEN1 is pantidic neuroendocrine neoplasm and the most common pantidic neuroendocrine neoplasm is anyone? Gastrinoma, zollinger ellison syndrome. So gastrinoma is the most common tumor. Okay, I will repeat, most common manifestation of MEN1 is pituitary adenoma causing hypercalcemia. Most common pituitary tumor is prolactinoma. Most common cause of death in MEN1 syndrome is pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasm. And the most common type of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasm in MEN1 is gastrinoma, causing zollinger ellison syndrome. And what is the most common manifestation of MEN2A and 2B? Most common manifestation is uh, your uh, medullary thyroid cancer. And the most common cause of death is also medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, most common cause of death is also going to be medullary thyroid cancer. This is the usual reason for death in patients with MEN2B. In MEN2A and MEN2B, among this also common question exam, MEN2A versus MEN2B, which is going to produce parathyroid adenomas. Only 10% cases, but still only MEN2A tend to produce parathyroid adenomas, which means primary hyperparathyroidism can be seen in MEN2A, but it will not be seen in patients with MEN2B. Even that's a very important point. So this table tells you the entire picture of MEN1, MEN2A and MEN2B, but in exam they might ask something called as MEN4 syndrome. Okay, this is due to cyclin dependent kinase deficiency, cytin dependent kinase inhibitor deficiency, it's called CDKN2B deficiency. And how will you, it's also autosomal dominant inheritance. And how will you diagnose MEN4? It is nothing but MEN1 plus you will have reproductive organ tumors. MEN1 plus reproductive organ tumors. Okay, MEN1, same MEN1 features, parathyroid adenoma, pituitary adenoma and pantic neurotechnic neoplasms. Along with, if you see reproductive organ tumors, that is MEN4. That's all. Okay. It's a very rare, very, very rare syndrome. So, this is multiple endocrine neoplasia. Now, you have ticked off the MEN syndromes also. Next, let us move on to question number 5. So, 34-year-old man presents to the emergency room after he was found to be confused by his friend at home. He is alert but disoriented. His friend relays that uh, he was recently fired from his job and he has been at home for the last week drinking too much lately. So he is continuously drinking alcohol. He is A febrile, pulse rate is 68, BP 140-86 and has a moist mucous membranes with normal capillary refill time and skin turgor. Everything is normal. Look at his sodium. Sodium alone is 126 milligrams per liter. CBG is okay. 120 milligrams per deciliter. Urine osmolality is 75 milliosmols per kilogram. What is the next step in the management? So what will you do? Administer loop diuretic, give fluid restriction, IV normal saline, toll waptan. So what is your choice? What is the choice? Okay. It's a simple question. But for that you need to understand. Okay. How will you evaluate a hyponatremia? So how you are going to evaluate hyponatremia? When a patient is coming with hyponatremia, remember the first step, very commonly asked in exams, the first step is to look at serum osmolality. That's what you need to see. First step, serum osmolality. So if you are going to see a normal or increased serum osmolality, it will be a false hyponatremia. It's not a true hyponatremia. It's a false hyponatremia. Okay. If it's normal or increased, it's false. If it's reduced, then it's a kind of true hyponatremia, otherwise called as hypotonic hyponatremia. Hypotonic hyponatremia. This is a true hyponatremia. This is not false. 
So what is the normal serum osmolality? Normal serum osmolality is going to be in the range of 280 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram or milliosmoles per liter. So this is a normal serum osmolality. If it's in this range or more than this, it's false hyponatremia. If it's less than that, you can call it as hypotonic hyponatremia or true hyponatremia. If it's going to be false hyponatremia, what is the next step? So see whether the serum osmolality is normal or serum osmolality is increased. If the serum osmolality is normal, it is called as normo-osmolar or normotonic hyponatremia. It is a normo-osmolar hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality is increased, it is called as hyperosmolar hyponatremia. If it's increased, it's called as hyperosmolar hyponatremia or hypertonic hyponatremia. So, what are the cause of normo-osmolar hyponatremia? The other name for normo-osmolar hyponatremia is pseudo-hyponatremia. It's a technical error. It's a machine error. And this usually occurs due to very high proteins in the blood, like multiple myeloma or very high level of lipids, like hyperlipidemia. Very high level proteins, very high level lipids. Okay, that is the reason for pseudo-hyponatremia. So, this could occur due to either conditions like multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia or high level of lipids can occur due to conditions like familial hyperlipidemia. If it's going to be due to hyperosmolar, if the serum osmolality is high, it is hyperosmolar hyponatremia. And this is usually due to presence of hyperosmolar agents in the blood, like mannitol, or maybe it can be due to very high level of glucose in the blood, which occurs in conditions like diabetic ketosis and hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, otherwise called as hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, HHS. So usually it occurs in hyperglycemic emergencies. Here you need to see a small data here. That remember, for every 100 milligrams increase in blood glucose beyond a value of 100, your serum sodium is going to falsely reduce by a value of 2.4 millicoulons per liter. So that is why you need to know a concept of something called as corrected serum sodium. So what is corrected serum sodium? Corrected serum sodium is equal to the glucose value in the blood minus 100 divided by 100 multiplied by 2.4 plus the actual serum sodium that you are predict that is predicted by the machine. For example, if the blood glucose values are 600, let us assume, and the serum sodium is 130 millicoulons per liter. Okay, serum sodium is 130 millicoulons per liter. So what will be the corrected serum sodium? Corrected serum sodium is 600 minus 100 divided by 100 multiplied by 2.4 plus the actual sodium that is 130, which is equal to 500 by 100 is 5 multiplied by 2.4 plus 130 which you, you will get around 12 plus 130, that is 142 milliequivalents per liter. So this is the corrected serum sodium. So which means what I am trying to say is, if I remove the osmotic effect of glucose, if I correct the glucose, if I remove the osmotic effect of glucose and make the glucose to a value of 100, my serum sodium will be 142. I repeat, if I correct the glucose to a value of 100, my serum, os uh, serum sodium will become 142. Which means here, this hyponatremia I need not even correct. Just if I correct the glucose itself, that's enough. My serum sodium will automatically become 142. That's what is going to be the concept of corrected serum sodium. I think you can get it, what I'm trying to say. So that is why whenever you are having a diabetic ketosis patient, if you are measuring anion gap, because diabetic ketosis is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. What is the formula for anion gap? Sodium minus bicarbonate plus chloride. Sodium minus bicarbonate plus chloride. So because you are using sodium value, always use corrected sodium. Always use corrected sodium. Always use corrected sodium. Otherwise, your anion gap will be normal in DK because anion gap is a very important measurement in DK because that is a therapeutic marker. You have to give IV insulin till your anion gap is corrected. So let us assume you are using the same sodium, okay, just like that, serum sodium you are using. What will happen? Your actual, I mean, you are falsely using a lower serum sodium. Because you are using a lower serum sodium, their anion gap will be low. And their anion gap may be falsely normal. So you might think there is no increase in anion gap at all. So you might think even of other conditions apart from DK. Only if you use the corrected serum sodium, you will get the correct anion gap. That is why even in diabetic ketosis or any condition with hyperglycemia, the sodium in the anion gap must be corrected sodium and not the actual sodium. That is very, very important. Okay. Okay. Now, these are the important causes of hypertonic hyponatremia. 
then what about hypotonic hyponatremia now what is the next step if it's a hypotonic hyponatremia next step is to look at the volume status of the body you see clinically patient is dehydrated or patient is having edema patient is having low jvp or high jvp ascites effusion or patient is having hypotension and shock oliguria is a sign of hypolemia so you have to see the volume status of the patient clinically you have to look at the volume status so volume can be low called as hypovolemic hyponatremia volume can be normal called as euvolemic hyponatremia and volume can be increased called as hypervolemic hyponatremia if it's hypovolemic hyponatremia if the volume status is low next step is to look at the urine sodium if you look at the urine sodium if the urine sodium is low like less than 20 less than 10 then it indicates that the patient is losing sodium somewhere else not through the kidneys because kidneys are trying to conserve sodium so it must be extra renal cause like diarrhea vomiting something like that if the urinary sodium is high then it confirms that the patient is losing sodium in the urine that's causing hypolemia and hyponatremia so which means it must be a salt wasting state so where the patient is losing the salt in the urine in the kidney salt wasting so there are two types of salt wasting one is peripheral salt wasting and second is central salt wasting peripheral salt wasting commonest cause addison disease primary adrenal insufficiency addison disease that is due to aldosterone deficiency primary adrenal insufficiency aldosterone deficiency addison disease peripheral salt wasting what about central salt wasting here there will be a central problem anything meningitis tumor tuberculosis neurocystis sarcosis any central problem causing salt wasting because of increased release of brain natriuretic peptide that is central salt wasting or cerebral salt wasting syndrome CSWS and what if the patient is euvolemic here the patient will have normal BP normal skin turgor the volume status will be completely normal no hypervolemia as well as no hypovolemic state here there is no need to see urine sodium you have to see urine osmolality here if the urine osmolality is less than 100 or urine osmolality is more than 100 the urine osmolality is more than 100 which means patient is gaining water from the urine because the urine is concentrated which means the patient is absorbing more water from the urine that's why that water is accumulating in the body causing dilution of sodium causing hyponatremia so where the water is coming from kidney so when kidneys will conserve water when there is more ADH called as syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis there are two other endocrine conditions that are very important DDs for SADH what are the two important endocrine conditions cortisol deficiency remember aldosterone deficiency will produce only salt wasting cortisol deficiency will not produce salt wasting cortisol deficiency will not produce salt wasting and apart from this patient can also have mixed edema severe hypothyroidism even that is a condition that can result in development of SADH these are three important conditions or SADH like conditions these are the three most important apart from that what about urinosmolality less than 100 here the patient is having a dilute blood causing hyponatremia not due to kidneys absorbing more water the water is coming from some other source it could be psychogenic polydipsia always called as functional polydipsia or alternatively there is something called as low solute hyponatremia low solute hyponatremia so remember your urine output is coupled with your solutes this is a tough concept but i'll try to explain what happens here so what is the average solute i mean this is a totally different concept let me explain you here so what is the average amount of solute that you are taking average solute intake by an average adult it is 750 milli equivalents per day okay in 24 hours you take 750 milli equivalents average amount of solute intake per day most of us this is the amount of solute we take and what is the maximum urinary concentration maximum urinary concentration that you can reach in the kidneys maximum urine osmolality it is 1200 milli osmols per liter okay this is the maximum urinary concentration that you can reach Similarly, there is something called minimum urinary concentration that you can each reach. This is the least minimum. Below that, you cannot go. How you cannot go beyond 1200? Likewise, you cannot come below this value. What is that? That is 50 milliosmoles per liter. So, this is the minimum urinary concentration. 
beyond that you cannot dilute the urine it's not possible so let us assume in case if you want to excrete okay in case if you want to excrete 750 milli equivalents in 50 milli osmoles per liter of urine okay what will be the amount of urine output if you want to excrete 750 milli osmoles milli equivalents of a uh, milli osmoles per day so it's not milli equivalents basically it is milli osmoles okay 750 milli osmoles of solute okay in dilute urine 50 milli osmoles per liter of urine your urine output will be 15 liters which means what i'm trying to say is because you cannot go below this 50 milli osmoles per liter of urinary concentration this must be the maximum amount of urine output beyond 15 liters you will not pass because you don't have enough solutes to pass more urine up to 15 liters only you can pass if you're taking 750 milli osmoles of solutes per day that's a maximum urine output that you can reach so if somebody is taking more than 15 liters of water intake more than 15 liters if i'm taking and if i'm taking only 750 milli osmoles of solute per day i will not be able to pass urine beyond 15 liters which means whatever water i'm taking beyond 15 liters is going to accumulate in the body that is what we called as psychogenic polydysia that excess water is going to cause hyponatremia okay do you understand which means your urine output is always linked to your solute intake so most of the psychogenic polydipsia patients will be drinking like more than 15 liters of water then only they can develop hyponatremia in the first place or paradoxically let us assume i'm not drinking enough water i mean too much of water but if my solute intake is low if my solute intake is low so let us assume i am taking only 50 milli osmoles per day of solute i'm taking only 50 milli osmoles per day solute only 50 os milli osmoles per day solute i'm taking how much urine output what is the maximum urine output i can achieve what is the maximum urine output i can achieve if i'm taking only 50 milli osmoles of solute the maximum dilution i can reach is 50 milli osmoles per liter i'm taking only 50 milli osmoles per day of solute so the maximum urine output i can reach is just one liter that's all so if i'm taking low solute then also i'll develop hyponatremia which means anything beyond one liter of water if i take i'll end up with hyponatremia so it's not just too much of water that's going to cause hyponatremia it's too little solute is also going to cause hyponatremia that's called low solute hyponatremia and that occurs in two conditions one is beer potamania okay beer potamania number one second one is called as tea and toast diet so this is usually consumed by elderly people okay tea and toast diet by elderly people many elderly people will consume only tea and toast because they don't have anyone in home to make any food for them that is the assumption so that's what we call as tea and toast diet so in these two conditions the solute intake will be very very low so patients will develop uh, low solute hyponatremia so remember i'll tell you one interesting thing so that you won't understand the low solute hyponatremia you know what is the cause of death of bruce lee many people assume so many things people think that bruce lee died because of intoxication actually no the real reason why bruce lee died is low solute hyponatremia because he wants to keep his body fit so he tends to consume very low solutes and before his death he has been admitted two times for cerebral edema and hyponatremia and even in autopsy the only finding that the doctors could make is massive cerebral edema and that's because continuously he used to take low solute to keep his body fit and that's the reason for death of bruce lee okay that's there everywhere so if you want scientific article you can go and search for it okay so thank you so much dr ali usman if sorry for the wrong pronunciation if at all i have done you have been seeing my lectures from ethiopia thank you so much okay this is the death of bruce lee okay so what about hyperolemic hyponatremia so if it's a hyperolemic hyponatremia you're going to see urine sodium again so you're going to see urine sodium again if urine sodium is going to be high so here you need to know where the sodium is coming from because the patient is in hyperolemic state because the patient is in hyperolemic state there is sodium excess in the body so where that excess sodium is coming from see the urine sodium if the urine sodium is low which means kidneys are the ones that are absorbing more sodium into the body 
that's causing my hypervolemic state so what is that condition anything that activates ras okay renal angiotensin aldosterone system what are the three classic condition that activate ras even in your sleep if somebody asks you they I wake you up and if they ask you what are the three classic ras activated states cirrhosis number 1 congestive heart failure number 2 and nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome cirrhosis congestive cardiac failure nephrotic syndrome classic ras activated states even when they wake up and ask you you should say this even in sleep whenever the urinary sodium is increased which means there is a primary damage to the kidneys that is nothing but ak and ckd low gfr states low gfr states okay kidney failure urinary sodium is high because kidneys have lost the power of absorbing solutes that's what happens so the question is how will you treat hyponatremia treatment of hyponatremia pretty much simple and straight forward so how will you treat very simple number 1 see whether the patient is having severe symptoms or not severe symptoms means you are talking about altered mental status coma and seizures okay if the patient is having severe symptoms then immediately you have to cho choose only 3% nacl hypertonic saline immediate institution of 3% nacl hypertonic saline if the patient is having non severe symptoms okay if it's non severe then you can look at the type of hyponatremia and correct in case if the patient is having hypovolemic hyponatremia hypovolemic hyponatremia i am going to treat with 0.9% nacl 0.9% nacl it is usual regular normal saline so it corrects the volume also it corrects the hypo hypovolemia also i mean hyponatremia also if it's a euvolemic hyponatremia what i'm going to do you have to see the urine osmolality if the urine osmolality is increased if the urine osmolality is high which means i am absorbing more water from the kidneys that's why urine is concentrated so here i am going to use fluid restriction plus or minus i can use aquaretic agents what are aquaretic agents aquaretic agents means we are talking about paptens and demiclocycline in western countries they use demiclocycline in india we don't use because it can cause permanent nephrogenic dependence but as we use vaptens very commonly tol vapten plus or minus these are very very powerful agents you know adh is going to absorb more water aquaretics means they are going to spill more water into the urine that's what vaptens do they block the adh receptor v2 receptor in the kidney causing more water spillage into the urine that's called aquaretics so you lose water into the urine so the blood will get concentrated so you have the solution of hyponatremia so that's what i'm going to do if the urine osmolality is high if the urine osmolality is low in case if the urine osmolality is low then you need to see what is the type of hyponatremia if it is psychogenic polydipsia then just give fluid restriction stop that patient from drinking more water that's the treatment if the urine osmolality is low and if the patient is having low solute hyponatremia if you are suspecting low solute hyponatremia give solutes to wash out that water from the body that is the treatment give solute give solute that's the treatment if it's a hypovolemic high volemic hyponatremia the pain is having hypervolemic hyponatremia the pain is having hypervolemic hyponatremia then you are going to give fluid restriction plus or minus loop diuretics that's all loop diuretics to remove the volume status loop diuretics okay and you are going to give fluid restriction Do doctor is asking what deprivation test you can explain water deprivation test can you explain yes the next question is about water deprivation test and we'll come back to that so fluid restriction plus or minus loop diuretics that is the treatment for hypervolemic hyponatremia so look at our patient now i told you everything about hyponatremia how to assess look at our patient our patient is having hyponatremia okay hyponatremia and is symptomatic symptomatic hyponatremia okay and look at his volume status look at his volume status bp normal moist mucous membranes a febrile pulse rate is not high not hypovolemic state and everything is fine so this patient is euvolemic symptomatic euvolemic hyponatremia with the symptomatic euvolemic hyponatremia next step is look at the urine osmolality urine osmolality is less than 100 so look at the urine osmolality urine osmolality is less than 100 so we are in this area so euvolemic either it could be a psychogenic polydipsia or low solute hyponatremia 
so we have been very clear that the patient is drinking continuously for the last so many days because of some stressful event so this is basically a low solute hyponatremia that's what we are dealing with low solute hyponatremia so what is the treatment give solutes iv normal saline that's the right answer are you understanding or not that's it here you are going to give iv normal saline replace the solutes fluid restriction i would have done if i'm thinking about sadh so what will be the feature of sadh sadh will have high urine osmolality and high urine sodium with a low serum osmolality and low serum sodium whenever you see this opposite arrows high urine osmolality high urine sodium low urine osmolality low urine sodium think about sadh in exam so there you can try fluid restriction and there you can try vaptans also aquaretics also loop diuretic i'll administer only in patients with hyperolemic state fluid restriction loop diuretic will be a treatment of hyperolemic hyponatremia not here right answer for this is iv normal sorry that's the right answer okay it's a simple question even though it has a lot of concepts behind it going to the next question endocrinology question number 6 a 76 year old woman with alzheimer disease alzheimer disease and amyloidosis presents to the emergency with confusion and lethargy her vitals are stable on examination she is somnolent and easily arousable with dry mucous membranes okay look at this point dry mucous membranes serum sodium is 156 millicolons per liter which means she is hypernatremic hypernatremic and cbg is 140 urine osmolality is 225 milliosmols per liter and serum osmolality is 335 she is having a high serum osmolality but a low urine osmolality opposite of what you are seeing in sadh even sadh what you see high urine osmolality with low serum osmolality but here you are seeing high serum osmolality with low urine osmolality opposite of sadh that itself tells it's very likely to be a diabetes sensibilis IV no, IV fluid is started. Normal saline is administered over the next 12 hours, and she vomits 1.5 liters of urine. And repeat sodium is 154. It has brought down the sodium to some extent, but not completely. And the urine osmolality is still 255 milliosmols per kilogram. And desmopressin is administered, and urine osmolality increases to 290. What is the most likely diagnosis? So very simple. First of all. in most of the exams when they talk about diabetes insipidus they will give a patient with a history of polyuria okay number 1 they can have polydipsia polyuria and polydipsia polyuria and polydipsia i'll tell you in a very simplified manner so what is the definition of polyuria whenever you pass more than 3 liters urine output is more than 3 liters per day that is polyuria or if it is more than 2 liters per meter square okay if the urine output is more than 2 liters per meter square that is polyuria or if the urine output is more than 40 ml per kilogram per day these are definitions that you can use in children that is also called as polyuria what is polydipsia if the fluid intake if the fluid intake is more than 6 liters per day or more than 100 ml per kilogram per day 100 ml per kilogram per day this is polydipsia the fluid intake is more than 6 liters per day or fluid intake is more than 100 ml per kilogram per day this is polydipsia so whenever they have polydipsia and especially polyuria leave about polydipsia whenever someone has polyuria there are only two causes one it must be solute diuresis one it must be solute diuresis and second it must be water diuresis second it must be water diuresis okay solute diuresis and water diuresis So solute diuresis means some solutes you are taking. So for example, mannitol will be there, three percent NaCl will be there in the system. So that will be the cause. Usually here urine osmolality will be high. Usually, whenever there is water diuresis, the urine osmolality will be low. Generally, as a NEET PG exam going candidate, you need to know that will be less than three hundred. Usually, urine osmolality will be less than three hundred. That is water diuresis, which means you are passing more water in the urine. there are only two causes of water diuresis in the world that you need to know one is diabetes insipidus second is psychogenic polydipsia these are the only two causes that tend to produce water diuresis so just remember those two remaining everything will be solute diuresis these are the only two causes of water diuresis diabetes insipidus usually in exam if the examiner is like uh, for example what to say if the examiner is very liberal he will tell that the patient is having hypernatremia hypernatremia this is the straightforward giveaway easy clue psychogenic polydipsia patients hyponatremia that's all so if you see in exam hypernatremia with low urine osmolality always think about diabetes insipidus as the first probability first possibility 
But the problem is some patients can have normal sodium. Some patients can have normal serum sodium also. This is where the problem is. If I'm having normal serum sodium, but if I'm having features of water diuresis, this is the place where I'm going to do a water deprivation test. Water deprivation test or otherwise called as Miller-Moses test. Otherwise called as Miller-Moses test. And second test I'm, I can do is DDAVP test. That's called Desmopressin test. So these are the two tests I'm going to perform. In confusing cases, in straightforward cases, there's no doubt. But in confusing cases, I can do this testing. So what is the basic understanding of this test? So first of all, you need to know a graph. This is a simple graph I'm going to draw. I'm going to plot the serum osmolality in x-axis and the urine osmolality in the y-axis. So what happens? Whenever serum osmolality increases, urine osmolality also will increase. Okay, this is normal. You know, the maximum urine osmolality that you can reach is 1200. The minimum urine osmolality that you can reach is 50. Okay, that's all. This is the rule in the kidneys. Maximum 1200, minimum 50. You cannot go beyond that also. You can go. You cannot come lesser than this also. 50 also. This is normal. Which means as you increase the serum osmolality, your urine osmolality also is going to increase. How can you increase the serum osmolality? By two mechanisms. You can increase the serum osmolality. One simple way to increase serum osmolality is by doing water deprivation water deprivation. I am, if I am not drinking water, my serum osmolality will increase because my blood will become concentrated without water. So what I am going to do is I am going to do a water deprivation test. Remember psychogenic polydipsia patients are normal patients like you and like me. They are, their problem is in the brain. It's a functional problem. They drink too much of water. So the moment you deprive water, okay, uh, in a patient with psychogenic polydipsia, they are going to behave like normal individuals. So their curve will be something like this. You start water deprivation. Okay, the moment you start water deprivation, the curve will increase. They will mimic a normal curve. That is patients with psychogenic polydipsia. So this is the point where you started the water deprivation. Okay, and the moment you started water deprivation and increase the serum osmolality, their curve will become like normal individuals. But if I'm having a genuine ADH problem, diabetes insipidus, now despite doing water deprivation, my urine osmolality is not going to increase because it's an ADH problem. It's actually an organic problem, not a functional problem. So my serum osmolality will increase with water deprivation, but urine osmolality will not increase any further. Urine osmolality will not increase. This itself tells this is a curve of diabetes insipidus. So, now I want to find out what is the type of diabetes insipidus, whether it's ADH deficiency or whether it is ADH resistance. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to inject desmopressin. I'm going to inject desmopressin. The moment I inject desmopressin, if it's ADH deficiency, I'm replacing ADH with desmopressin. So my urine osmolality will increase. This confirms it is central diabetes insipidus. If it's ADH resistance, this will be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. I think you can understand this graph much better. So using water deprivation, I can find out whether it is psychogenic polydipsia or diabetes insipidus. Using desmopressin test, I can find out whether it is deficiency or resistance, central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. That's what I'm trying to figure out. That's why I can easily put a table here. Easily I can use a table. So first urine osmolality, then I'm going to use water deprivation post water deprivation urine osmolality okay post water deprivation urine osmolality then i'm going to use post desmopressin urine osmolality post ddavp post desmopressin urine osmolality i'm going to check all this so remember in all these three causes psychogenic polydipsia central diabetes insipidus as well as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus the urine osmolality to begin with will be low only it will be less than 300 in all these causes but what about after water deprivation, the urine osmolality will increase. But there won't be any much change in the urine osmolality if it's a diabetes insipidus. It will still be less than 300. After giving desmopressin, the urine osmolality is not going to change in psychogenic polydipsia. Why desmopressin will not have any effect in psychogenic polydipsia? Because whatever maximum they have to reach, they have reached during water deprivation itself. Giving additional desmopressin is not going to increase the urine osmolality any further because they have reached the peak already during water deprivation. So there is no change. But central diabetes insipidus patients will experience the increase in urine osmolality. 
Why? That is because it is due to ADH deficiency. But there won't be any change in the urine osmolality in nephrogen gametes because there is ADH resistance. ADH resistance. So you need to define how much increase is considered to be deficiency versus resistance. If increase by more than 50 percentage, it is very likely to be central. If increase is by less than 50 percentage, it is very likely to be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. If the urine osmolality increases by less than 50 percentage after giving desmopressin, it is nephrogenic. If the urine osmolality increases by more than 50 percent after giving desmopressin, it is central. So usually the clue in exam is very simple. So no matter what you do, no matter what you do, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, urine osmolality will always be less than 300. Always be less than 300. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, urine osmolality will always be less than 300 in a patient with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. That is the clue. That itself is a big clue. In central, definitely at one point it will increase to more than 300. In psychogenic policy also it will increase to more than 300. Nephrogenic, no matter what you do, it will not increase to more than 300. It will be less than 300 only. That itself is a straightforward giveaway for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So what's the treatment? Treatment is nothing here in patients with psychogenic polydipsia. It's just uh, counseling and psychiatric treatment or cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever. And for central diabetes insipidus, it is desmopressin, straightforward choice. For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, you cannot use desmopressin even though some patients may respond to some extent with desmopressin. But the main treatment here is going to be thiazides or you can try a trial of indomethacin. Trial of indomethacin also can work. Sometimes NSAIDs also might work because prostaglandins are close related to the urinary concentration. So thiazides are trial of indomethacin. That is for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But DDAVP is the main treatment for central diabetes insipidus. Okay. So what's going to occur here? Um, the right answer here is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Why? Here you can see that despite giving desmopressin, my urine osmolality is still less than 300. It is less than 300, 290. Or I can compare the 255 and 290. How much it has increased? It is increased by less than 50 percentage. You can easily say. So less than 50 percentage increase after giving desmopressin. And obviously like urine osmolality is less than 300 even after giving desmopressin that confirms it is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Central means it should have gone beyond 300 and there should be more than 50 percent rise for sure. GA free water loss and all is just a dummy choice. Lack of access to free water is also a dummy choice. That's not right. So this question is done and dusted. Let us move on to the next one. Which of the following statements is false with regards to Klinefelter syndrome? Now we are entering reproductive endocrinology section. So option A is adrenal supple uh, androgen supplementation is useful. Option B is patients are at increased risk of breast tumors. Option C is reduced plasma estrogen. Option D is most cases are diagnosed after puberty. Okay, so what is the right answer for this question? So, you want me to say the answer? The right answer for this question is going to be reduced plasma estrogen. Okay, that's the right answer. So, why? Because in patients with Klinefelter syndrome, there will be increased plasma estrogen and not reduced plasma estrogen. And probably that is the main reason why uh, patients are going to have gynecomastia. Okay, reduced plasma estrogen. That's not the right answer. It is increased plasma estrogen. So, what is Klinefelter syndrome basically? Klinefelter syndrome is 47XXY, which means these are men. So, why these are men? Because they are having XY in the system. XY in the system. Somebody is asking, clinically, you cannot differentiate CDA or NDA. It's very difficult, clinically. Okay, but even though clinical features will be there, for example, patients will have some cranial problem if it's a central diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic patients will have like renal problem, but it's actually not that easy to differentiate. That's why we have all this testing. So XY means their phenotype will be males only. Okay, because of the additional X. So this extra X is going to produce a lot of effect. So that's called extra X effect. The most important effect is the testicular failure. Testicular failure. So when does the testicular failure occur? Testicular failure usually occurs during puberty. Especially during puberty, that is where you are going to get testicular failure. So during puberty means many patients will experience puberty, but later on they will have a stalled puberty, which means puberty will occur. These patients will experience enlargement. Initially, there will be increase in size of the testis. Increased testicular size is common in these patients initially, but later, the spermatogenesis and testosterone production will be affected and 
the testicular size will decrease and they will become fibrotic over a period of time. So basically it's not failure of puberty, it will be a stalled puberty. So these patients, if you examine in later stages, they will have very small testes and fibrotic testes. You can see it's a firm fibrotic small testes in these people. Testicular examination is very, very important in reproductive endocrinology. So testicular failure, very, very characteristic. And because of this only, many patients will be tall statured. Tall, because androgens close the epiphysis. Because there is no androgens, the patients will grow tall. Tall stature. Second, patients will have good amount of hair. Increased scalp hair, because androgens will cause male pattern hair loss. So that won't be there in this patient. But there will be reduced facial hair. Because no testosterone. The bird and the moustache and all will not be there that much in this patient. So increases scalp hair, but reduced facial hair. And they will have loss of libido and gonadal dysfunction, loss of libido and they might have erectile dysfunction also. That is because of testicular failure. If they ask you first what will be affected, first spermatogenesis only will be affected. First spermatogenesis will be lost, then only your testosterone production will be lost because who is performing spermatogenesis? Your Sertoli cells, yes for yes, Sertoli cells, spermatogenesis. Who is going to secrete testosterone? It is Leydig cells. Leydig cells are going to secrete testosterone. So, first is spermatogenesis will be lost, then only your testosterone levels will start coming down. And because of low testosterone, many patients will have increased amounts of estrogen. And this is also one main reason why many people develop gynecomastia. Many people will develop gynecomastia. And apart from that, patients can have plenty of problems. The most important is testicular failure and associated problems only. But other problems are also common. Some people will have intellectual disabilities. And there is heightened risk of male breast cancers. Male breast cancer. Whenever you talk about male breast cancer, two things you need to know for exam. One is BRCA mutations and second is Klinefelter syndrome. I will repeat, whenever you see a male breast cancer, male breast cancer, think about two things. One is BRCA mutation. BRCA mutations also can cause male breast cancer and second is Klinefelter syndrome. Very important cause of male breast cancer. So increase in the risk of breast tumors in males. So obviously because it's due to testosterone defect, androgen deficiencies, androgen supplementation is useful. Patients are at increased risk of breast tumors, that's correct. Because of gynecomastia and high estrogen, you know estrogen is a trophic hormone. If it acts on the breast, that can result in breast tumors, that's correct. Male breast cancer. Most cases are diagnosed after puberty, that's correct. Because most of the people will experience puberty. Initiation of puberty is normal in most individuals. But the puberty will not progress any further because of failure of testicles. That's a stalled puberty rather than failure of puberty. Puberty occurs, but it fails to progress. Stalled puberty. And reduced plasma estrogen. Okay, yes, that's wrong. Because the patients will have increased plasma estrogen, not reduced plasma estrogen. Reduced testosterone is correct, not estrogen. So that is all about question number 7, Klinefelter syndrome. So I need to give one question with regards to reprotein technology. That's why I have given this question. So we have multiple chapters as well. So now coming to the 8th question, an elderly man who is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis is admitted to the hospital after a car accident. CT scan reveals a splenic laceration and emergency splenectomy was performed. In the ICU, his BP is 70 upon 50 millimeters of mercury with an increase of only 82 bar 52 after a bolus of 2 liters of normal saline. Repeat, repeat CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis shows no hemorrhage. What is the most appropriate next step? This is very commonly encountered situation in your critical care scenario. It might look as if it's a tough question, but it's basically very, very simple and straightforward. And many times we experience this in the ICUs. So patient has some critical illness. Here, patient is critically ill. Patient is having some sort of critical illness. Okay. So what, I mean, the patient is hypotensive. Okay. And you are giving fluids. And patient is not respond, responding to fluids despite being hypolemic. And uh, in this situation, first you have to suspect hemorrhage because the patient is already having a splenic laceration and underwent an emergency splenectomy. So you have to load hemorrhage first because there could be some ongoing hemorrhage. That's why they have done the repeat CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis, but there was no evidence of hemorrhage. See, without evidence of hemorrhage, how can you go for exploratory laparotomy? That's ruled out. There is no hemorrhage. Then why I need to do another exploratory laparotomy? IABP is for left ventricular failure. I am not suspecting a left ventricular failure here. So it's not IABP, intraartic balloon counterpulsation. It's not septic shock because 
the problem is completely different here right answer by exclusion it itself is administered hydrocortisone only but what is the key principle here to understand in critically ill patients there will be increased cortisol consumption increased cortisol consumption which means adrenals are producing cortisol relatively better adrenals are not having any problem they are secreting cortisol but consumption of cortisol by the organs are increasing because of critical illness this will result in a syndrome called as sersi what is sersi that's called as critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency that's what is occurring here so empirically whenever you suspect a sersi in a critically ill patient who is not responding to the usual treatment that they are supposed to respond you can administer an empirical hydrocortisone this is such a common entity in the icus that's called critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency that is because whatever cortisol high amount of cortisol adrenal gland is producing but that is not enough because the cells are consuming more cortisol too much more than what the adrenals can secrete okay that is a relative deficiency that's what called csc that's called critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency so in that situation empirically you can administer hydrocortisone for example if at all they have answered if they have given like uh, fever sepsis high total count then probably i would have maybe opted for vancomycin and triptyl and tazobactam but that's not the immediate treatment of sepsis though okay that's another sort of discussion we can discuss uh, septic shock later on not now okay right now we're not going to discuss septic shock but again trust me vancomycin and piptazil is one of the worst combination that you can use in your icus and there is a separate trial i don't know how much to tell to an undergrad student but there is a separate trial which says that addition of vancomycin and piperazil and tazobactam is going to increase the risk of aka and subsequent mortality that is why don't add vanco and piptaz together always add meropenem whenever you are adding vanco piptaz and vanco we don't know what is the reason but trials have shown increased risk of akn mortality with piptaz and vanco don't do that mero vanco is better always if at all you want a broad spectrum coverage with gram negative and gram positive go for mero vanco not for piptaz vanco that's another take home message okay so administer hydrocortisone that's the right answer here the key point is to understand is cot critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency see in critical care it's a common thing okay so i worked like almost like how many years four five years in critical care as a critical care head in one of the hospitals in chennai so in critical care there are only two things that you need to consider whenever a patient is not responding to usual treatment for shock one is acidosis second is cortisol deficiency it could be absolute or relative many times it will be relative cortisol deficiency that's sersi so whenever you are giving inotropes whenever you are, sorry not inotropes vasopressors whenever you are giving vasopressors whenever you are giving fluids but the patient is not responding think about two possibilities one acidosis because acidosis tends to produce vasodilatation pooling of blood shock will not resolve only if you correct the acidosis there will be vasoconstriction so the shock will improve second is sersi critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency so i give an empirical bolus of hydrocortisone no harm or third you can suspect occult cardiac failure also that you can uh, i mean assume by doing a like swan gans catheter only which is not important for you so fine all right so coming to question number 9 a patient has neurosurgery for pituitary tumor and requires resection of the gland which of the following functions of the adrenal gland will be preserved post operatively which of the following will be preserved post operatively they are resecting the gland altogether so morning peak of plasma cortisol level release of cortisol in response to stress and sodium retention in response to hypovolemia and all of the above what is the right answer for this which of the following will be preserved post operatively the right answer for this question is option c right answer for this question is option c sodium retention in response to hypovolemia So, if you have understood some of my previous classes, you should have been able to tell this pretty much easily because we are talking about a central hypopituitarism causing a central pituitary insufficiency. Correct. So, remember there are two types of adrenal insufficiency. One is primary adrenal insufficiency. Another one is secondary adrenal insufficiency. Two things. So, what is the problem in primary adrenal insufficiency? It's the problem of the pituitary. Pituitary is the problem here. 
sorry again i'm getting distracted because i got a call so here the problem is adrenal gland adrenal is the problem here what about secondary adrenal insufficiency here pituitary is the problem pituitary is the problem here pituitary is defective so here the problem is low cortisol and that is rising the acth reflexly acth is raised but the main problem is low cortisol and this raised acth is going to result in hyperpigmentation hyperpigmentation and what about central sec secondary adrenal insufficiency here the problem is low acth because the problem is the pituitary and that is causing low cortisol here the main problem is low acth that is causing low cortisol so because acth is low you are not going to see uh what hyperpigmentation here and what about aldosterone aldosterone levels will be low and adrenal androgen levels adrenal androgen levels will be low most importantly dheas dehydro ap androsterone uh, or androsterone and ione two different compounds but dheas is more important will be low what about secondary adrenal insufficiency the aldosterone levels will be normal and uh, your adrenal androgen levels will be low though your dhas levels will be low but aldosterone levels will be normal this is a very very important and crucial difference between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency because acth deficiency will not affect aldosterone because aldosterone is regulated by the ras system renin and angiotensin 2 renin and angiotensin 2 system is the one that regulates the aldosterone in the adrenal it's not the acth acth loss will not result in loss of aldosterone so that's the reason why primary adrenal insufficiency patients will have salt wasting so what do you mean by salt wasting there will be increased urinary sodium because of that there will be low serum sodium and they will have other electrolyte disturbances like hyperkalemia and mild metabolic acidosis these are all common features of adrenal insufficiency primary adrenal insufficiency that is addison disease and this low serum sodium hyponatremia will be a hypovolemic hyponatremia hypovolemic hyponatremia but whereas cortisol deficiency will not result in salt wasting so these patients will not have salt wasting not have salt wasting but they will have low serum sodium many times their serum sodium may be low but this will be uvolemic i told you cortisol deficiency will produce only uvolemic hyponatremia only aldosterone deficiency will produce hypovolemic hyponatremia but potassium will be normal and bicarbonate will be normal there will be no metabolic acidosis also in these individuals no salt wasting no hyperkalemia no metabolic acidosis only hyponatremia will be there that also will be predominantly uvolemic hyponatremia so this i mean if you have un understood the previous questions itself it's easy for you to understand right so look at this question so this is a patient with pituitary apoplexy we have discussed that already this is a patient with pituitary apoplexy so it's a pituitary problem that is why this patient is having only hyponatremia the potassium if you see it's normal that is mentioned in this question as well okay you won't have hyperkalemia and acidosis here and you can see creatinine is also normal why this point is important because of hypovolemia because of hypovolemia many times patients will have pre renal failure because of hypovolemia patients can have pre renal failure creatinine may be high but usually that will not be the case in secondary adrenal insufficiency so you won't get all these things that's the idea so what is the treatment what is the treatment treatment here will be to give hydrocortisone because you have to replace cortisol plus or minus if there is severe salt wasting you have to give fluorocortisone also fluorocortisone also has to be given what about this one secondary secondary you don't need to replace fluorocortisone just hydrocortisone is more than enough no need to give fluorocortisone hydrocortisone is enough so morning peak of plasma cortisol will be lost because there is no acth here there will be reduced acth so you cannot produce that cortisol peak release of cortisol in response to stress will be lost because there is no acth to cause that cortisol release from the adrenal gland and sodium retention in response to hypovolemia will be intact because this is a pituitary problem this is not an adrenal problem so this is basically mediated by ras system renin angiotensin aldosterone system so this is the right answer for this question answer is option c coming to the next question question number 10 a patient was suspected to have pheochromocytoma was started on labetalol he has a past medical history of depression for which he is taking sertraline 24 hour urine total metanephrines are elevated to 1.5 times the upper limit of normal okay which of the following is the next most appropriate step this is a little tough question i agree but 
So what you need to do, hold Lebetlol for one week and repeat testing, hold Cetralin for one week and repeat testing, refer immediately for surgical evaluation and measure 24 hour urine, fandil, mandelic acid. 24 hour urine VMA. So what are you going to do here? So what is your answer? 5 seconds. Okay, many people are answering option is C. Yes, the right answer is actually option B. Correct. You have to hold Cetralin for one week and repeat testing. That is very, very important point. You have to hold Cetralin for one week and repeat testing because there are plenty of drugs that, that can cause a falsely elevated false increase in the urinary metanephrines, plenty of drugs, okay, including SSRIs. TCS gen generally don't cause that, but SSRIs, these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors because of high level of serotonin in the synapse that can get metabolized to, it's an amine, right, that can be metabolized to metanephrine sometimes. So this kind of mild elevations, like for example, one, one to two times. So usually whenever metanephrines are elevated, it should be more than two to three times elevated. This is the exact Harrison statement. This is a question directly from Harrison. Nothing more than that. It should be elevated by more than two to three times at least. If it's not elevated by more than two to three times, if it's elevated by less than two times, many times it will be a false positive metanephrines. So that is why here the idea is to hold Cetralin for one week and repeat testing. Labetalol is not a problem here because it's an alpha and a beta blocker, nothing more than that. That's not going to change the metanephrine values. But sympathomimetic drugs, okay, like phenylephrine or any other sympathomimetic drug like cocaine or whatever sympathomimetic drug patient is getting, that can alter the metanephrine level. So usage of sympathomimetic drugs or amine reuptake inhibitors like SSRIs, so these are all can increase the metanephrine values. So these are false elevation, if at all, especially when it is less than two times, it's a false elevation. This is wrong because we are not suspecting pheochromos from here. Measure 24 hour urine mandelic, mandel, mandelic is also wrong because we never use VMA nowadays for pheochromos evaluation. It's only given in the biochemistry textbooks and nothing more than that. Whole labetalol is also unnecessary. It's not required. It will only rise, result in increase of the blood pressure. The question is how do you evaluate a patient with pheochromos So whenever you are suspecting a pheochromos in exam, what will be the key features? Even though there are six pieces of pheochromos so what will be the classic pheochrisis triad? Patients are going to present with intense headache, that is head pain, that's a pain. And patients are going to have drenching, that is severe sweating. And patients will have sudden increase in the systolic blood pressure. All SSRIs can result in falsely eleva false elevation of pattern reference. So sudden increase in systolic, I mean sudden increase in systolic blood pressure, most of the times it will be a paroxysmal elevation. Paroxysmal means whenever the tumor gets a bad mood, it's going to release more catecholamines and that's going to suddenly rise the blood pressure. Sudden increase in SBP. This is a typical pheo triad. This is called as pheo crisis triad. So if you are suspecting pheochromocytoma, what you have to do? You have to, I mean here the for the pheochromocytoma treatment of choice is phenoxybenzamine. For pheo crisis, treatment of choice is phenoxybenzamine. Everyone knows that. For pheo crisis as such, but even though we don't use phenoxybenzamine that often, so this is actually a practical question. So this is actually labetalol. So because uh, this is exactly one of my cases, that's why I put that over here. That's an exact line from Harrison also. That's why I frame that as a case because in our hospital, we commonly start labetalol. So why labetalol is so advantageous in pheochromocytoma? Because it's a combined alpha and beta blocker at the same sitting. So it's good actually. And it's a non-selective beta blocker also. So whenever you are suspecting pheochromocytoma, what you need to do? You need to uh, do urinary metanephrines. Metanephrines is the next step. That's what you need to do. Metanephrines. So what you have to do? You have urine, 24 hour urine metanephrines and you have plasma metanephrines. So when the patient is at high risk, like for example, past history of uh, pheochromocytoma or men's syndrome, then you can try plasma metanephrines. Otherwise, just go for 24 hour urinary metanephrine. So if you're doing 24 hour urinary metanephrine, you have to see whether it is elevated by one to two times or more than two times. If it's elevated by more than two to three times the upper limit of normal, then definitely it is like elevated only. Then next step is to localize CT and MRI of the abdomen. That's what I'm going to do. So now the tumor is confirmed, you have to do CT and MRI of the abdomen. If it's elevated by less than two times the upper limit of normal, then it's very likely to be a false positive elevation. 
false positive elevation. So in this situation, you repeat sample after stopping the suspected drug. Repeat test later on after stopping the suspected drug for one to two weeks. So it's a false positive elevation. If it's negative means it's negative. That's all. It's not pheochromocytomyp. It's normal. So CT and MRI of the abdomen, if it shows a mass, now it's confirmed. It's pheochromocytoma only. But if it's not showing any mass, once again here, I'm going to think about a false positive elevation. If it's not showing a mass, once again, I'm going to think about a false positive elevation. Why? Because CT and MRI of the abdomen is almost 99% plus sensitive Okay, for picking up pheochromocytoma. So it's extremely unlikely that the CT and MRI will be, CT and MRI of the abdomen will be normal in a patient with pheochromocytoma. It's 99% sensitive. So that's why if you don't see a mass, it's very likely to be a false positive elevation. So you have to repeat testing later on. If there is a mass, on the other hand, then it confirms it's a pheochromocytoma. So you have biochemical diagnosis and you have an imaging diagnosis also. Then you have to rule out multifocal disease. Now you have to rule out multifocal disease and you have to rule out metastatic disease. This is very important because that's going to alter the management. If it's a multifocal or a metastatic disease, how will you pick up? You have to do I-123 MIBG. This is what they will ask you in exam. This is an outdated scan. We don't do it. That's called I-123 MIBG. MIBG scan. Or you can do FDG PET. Okay, FDG PET. Simple FDG PET. That's what we do in India commonly. That's called fluorodeoxyglucose PET. But according to the textbooks, the most uh, standard, I mean, better scan to do is gallium dotated scans. Gallium 67 dotated PET. Dotated scans. This is considered to be the most sensitive for picking up multifocal and metastatic disease. So FDG PET is good for metastatic disease, malignancy, because in malignant tumors, the uptake will be high because of high metabolism. For metastatic, FDG PET is good. For multifocal disease, gallium 67 dotated scan is better. But that's not available in many places. So that's why in India, commonly we do FDG PET scan. So after now you know whether it's a multifocal disease or a metastatic disease. Now what you are going to do, you are going to start treatment. Treatment of choice is almost always surgery. Surgery is going to be the treatment of choice. There's no doubt about that. But before treatment, you need to control the blood pressure. Okay, how will you control? First, you will give alpha blockers. That's a very important point. You're going to start non-selective alpha blockers like phenoxybenzamine. After 24 to 48 hours, you're going to start with a non-selective beta blocker like propranolol. Both have to be given, but start with alpha, then you go for beta. Or you can start simultaneously alpha and beta blocker like labetal also, which is fine, which is not a problem. That's what is commonly used in India, in emergency practices, even Labetalol is fine. But anyway, so this is the thing that is given in the textbooks. That's why. So once the BP is consistently less than 160-90, then you can go for surgery. That's the idea. That's the final treatment of choice. Once the BP is consistently less than 160 upon 90, you can bring the patient for surgery. Okay. So the right answer for this question is option B. And now you have understood the evaluation of pheochromocytoma as well. Now coming to question number 11, which of the following statements is true regarding management of pheochromocytoma? So this must be straightforward and easy. Beta blockers are contraindicated in pheochromocytoma. Salt and fluid intake should be restricted. IV fentolamine is indicated in hyper, indicated for hypertension crisis and the surgery is rarely required in a patient with pheochromocytoma. So what do you think is the right answer? Okay. So what is true? So true is option C. IV fentolamine is indicated in hypertension crisis. That's correct. So beta blockers are not contraindicated in pheochromocytoma. You will give beta blockers, but after giving alpha blockers, it's not contraindicated. Salt and fluid intake should never be restricted. It should be liberalized. That's a very important point because one of the common advices that we give for any hypertension patient is to go for salt restriction. But in pheochromocytoma, you should not restrict salt because they will have severe postural hypotension and that postural hypotension is due to tachyphylaxis of the receptors in the leg so that the blood pools noradrenaline is released but it will not work because receptors are already sensitized with too much of noradrenaline and adrenaline so that will not work because of receptor tachyphylaxis postural hypotension is very very common that can lead to syncope so you should never restrict salt in patients with pheochromocytoma or should never restrict fluids in patients with pheochromocytoma that will result in more postural hypotension and during surgery also once you have removed the adrenal gland patient will rapidly collapse hypotension will ensue Introp hypotension is also due to 
poor salt and fluid intake before the operation. To avoid intra-op hypotension, after removing the adrenal gland, you should liberalize the salt and fluid intake pre-op itself. That's a wrong statement. Surgery is rarely record is wrong because surgery is the treatment of choice for pheochromothermia. Even in metastatic disease, you have to debulk the tumor first. IV fentolamine is indicated for hypertension crisis is correct because it's an alpha blocker. So for hypertension crisis that occurs, I mean it's not just phenoxybenzamine, any non-selective alpha blocker can be used. So right answer for this question is option C. They are asking which is true. Coming to question number 12. A 21 year old woman with a history of type 1 diabetes is brought to the emergency with nausea, vomiting, lethargy and dehydration. She is confused and not responding to commands. Look at her BP. Her BP is 80-40. Uh, heart rate is 112 beats per minute. Serum sodium is 126. And uh, serum potassium is 4.3, serum magnesium is 1.2 which is little low, blood urine nitrogen is 76, it's increased, normal blood urine nitrogen is uh, uh, less than 20, serum creatinine is 2.2 that's also increased and serum bicarbonate is just 10, chloride is 86, serum glucose is 720 milligrams per deciliter, all of the following are appropriate management steps except for the right answer. So that's a very simple question, right? What is this question technically? So this is TK, diabetic ketosis, as simple as that. This is a patient who is suffering from a diabetic ketoacidosis. How? The patient is having high glucose. Okay, patient is presenting with acidosis. Look at the serum bicarbonate. Patient is having acidosis. They have not done the ketone bodies, but very likely it could be a DK. And patient is having acute kidney injury. AK. And it's a pre-renal failure or intrinsic renal failure. Look at the bun creatinine ratio. Bun is 76, creatinine is 2.2. Definitely the bun creatinine ratio is more than 15. Bun creatinine ratio is not even more than 15. It's more than 20 actually. Bun creatinine ratio is more than 20, suggesting this AK is pre-renal AK. And this patient is likely having hypovolemia. Because of dehydration hypovolemia, patient is having pre-renal AK because of hypoperfusion to the kidneys. That's what is occurring in this individual. And serum sodium is 126. So this is a pseudo false hyponatremia or a true hyponatremia. This is a false hyponatremia or a true hyponatremia. This hyponatremia is very likely to be a false hyponatremia. Why it's false hyponatremia? You have to correct the sodium. So what is the corrected sodium in this individual? Corrected sodium in this individual. So actual sodium is 126 plus the glucose is 720 minus 100 divided by 100 multiplied by 2.4. 2.4. So 126 plus 720 minus 100 is 620. So let us assume um, it is 6 multiplied by 2.4 just to be simple it's 6.2 multiplied 2.4 I can understand but let us assume just 6 multiplied by 2.4 it is basically you will get around 14.4 uh, maybe somewhere around 15 so 126 plus 15 you will get somewhere around 141 milliequivalents per liter so if you remove the osmotic effect of glucose okay if you're going to remove the osmotic effect of glucose your serum sodium will be 141 which means the corrected sodium is normal. It's in fact hypernatremic, more than 140. So it's a false hyponatremia. So why you want to give a 3% NaCl? You need not give a 3% NaCl. That's a wrong statement. So remember, the treatment will be based on corrected serum sodium only, not the actual sodium. Why this question is important? Because some people might get confused that this... Uh, Confusion is due to hyponatremia. This occurs in real time. Sometimes if you're working in emergency, you might initially get confused that this hyponatremia is the reason for confusion, altered mental status and coma. So what you might give is, you might give 3% NaCl, which is not required. You have to correct the sodium and see what's happening. Clear? So that's wrong. So ABG definitely we will do. IV insulin potassium, it's one of the important treatment of DK. IV fluid bolus definitely I'll give. But what is the choice of IV fluid bolus? That's based on corrected sodium. So what is the therapy for DK? It's the FLIP therapy. FL stands for fluids. We have studied already in our previous lectures. I stands for insulin. P stands for potassium. I told you in detail so you can watch my previous lectures if you want. So I'm not going to talk now. So what will be the fluid choice? Look at the corrected sodium. Corrected serum sodium. Okay. If the corrected serum sodium is less than 140, 
then you give half normal saline sorry you give just a plain normal saline normal saline if the corrected serum sodium is more than 140 you are going to give half normal saline so this is the rational most rational way to give fluids but please understand hypotonic fluids like half normal saline are absolutely contraindicated in shock states you cannot give in patients who are in shock it will worsen the shock never give hypotonic solutions in shock it's absolutely contraindicated in shock if the patient is not in shock or once the shock is corrected then you can give half normal saline that's not a problem so what will be the fluid of choice this patient is having a corrected sodium as 141 what will be the fluid of choice please come on come on fast what will be the fluid of choice here corrected sodium is 141 so what will be the fluid of choice in this patient i'm not asking generally in this patient what will be the fluid of choice so who are you going to answer half normal saline i'll tell now itself look at the patient the patient is in shock the patient is in shock will you give half normal saline no despite having a corrected serum sodium of more than 140 in this patient i will use a 0.9 percent nacl only so if the patient is in shock forget everything life is very important resuscitate them normal saline that's it isogenic 0.9 percent normal saline that's the fluid of choice in this patient once the shock is corrected then probably you can go for half normal saline till that it's going to be plain 0.9 percent nacl only and look at the importance of the anion gap so calculate the anion gap if you are not using the corrected sodium look at the anion gap here patient is having a sodium of 126 minus what is the chloride chloride is 88 plus bicarbonate is 10 so what is the anion gap here anion gap is 98 right so anion gap is 28 98 126 minus 98 is 28 this is anion gap but if you use corrected serum sodium what is the anion gap 140 minus 80 141 minus 88 plus 10 right so what will be the answer here it will become 42 my god okay look at the answer here it is 42 43 right yeah 43 that is the anion gap 43 is the anion gap so that's the reason i said like you have to always use corrected sodium if you use the actual sodium in a patient's decay you might end up with a falsely low anion gap so you might think it's not that serious look at this this is very serious 43 anion gap is very very serious it's very high in fact you have to give iv insulin till you correct that anion gap anion gap should become normal for the correction of anion gap you have to use the i mean for for a corrected anion gap you have to use corrected sodium only you should not use the actual sodium that's why you need to know the importance of the corrected sodium so the right answer for this question is option a that is 3% NACL. Going to the next question. Let's look at this. This is the question number 13. A morbidly obese diabetic woman was on metformin but could not achieve glycemic control. She is previously osteoporotic. She had a previous osteoporotic fracture and the patient does not want to take injections. Which of the following would be suitable to reduce her glucose levels? Now, citagliptin, pyoglazone, canagliflozin, semaglutide. Which is the better option? So she is morbidly obese on metformin but could not achieve good control. She had an osteoporotic fracture in the past but does not want to take injections. She does not want injections. Note that point. Which of the following will be suitable to reduce her glucose levels? Reduce her glucose levels. Citagliptin, pyoglazone, canagliflozin or semaglutide. So the right answer for this question is option D semaglutide okay that's the right answer okay so why i don't want to use okay so why you don't want to use canagliflozin here why you want to use semaglutide here so to be able to reduce glucose levels first of all you need to understand the rationale here the patient is morbidly obese number one okay she had a prior osteoporotic fracture so I cannot use canagliflozin. I have to use semaglutide only. So why? Because semaglutide is available orally. She does not want to take injections, but semaglutide is available orally. So that's why the right answer is semaglutide. Let me tell. So what are the, I mean, if at all, see, the, it, now the current diabetic treatment is totally based on your priorities. If you want to reduce cardiovascular risk, if you want to reduce cardiovascular risk, what are the two drugs? One, you have to try SGLT2 inhibitors. 
and second is GLP-1 receptor agonists. So these are the two drugs that you need to try. If you want to reduce, if your primary aim is to reduce the cardiovascular risk, if you want to reduce the heart failure hospitalization (HFH), if you want to treat the heart failure, then SGLT2 inhibitors will be the best choice. To some extent, GLP-1 receptor agonists can be okay, but the best is SGLT2 inhibitors if you want to reduce heart failure hospitalizations. Third, what are the drugs that reduce weight? If weight loss is your priority, what are the drugs you have to use? You have to use either GLP-1 receptor analogs. Okay, this is the best drug, maximum weight loss. Okay, maximum weight loss. Okay, so GLP-1 receptor analogs. Second, SGLT2 inhibitors, very, very mild. But remember, metformin and DPP-4 inhibitors are weight neutral. They are weight neutral. Metformin and DPP-4 inhibitors are weight neutral. Because many of you will be studying pharmacology. So you will say like metformin promotes weight loss, but it doesn't promote that much of weight loss. And the weight loss caused by metformin is very, very, very negligible. And that is why if you look at any guidelines, take any guideline, ADA guideline, AAC guideline, anything you take, you look at Harrison also. They will say metformin is an agent that is weight neutral. It is no longer a weight losing drug. DP4 inhibitors like gliptins are also weight neutral drugs. They are not weight loss drugs. You need to understand. These are the only two drugs in diabetes that promote weight loss. In the GLP-1 maximum SGLT inhibitors, mild weight loss. So what are the side effects? Okay. So in osteoporosis, I mean, what are the side effects of different drugs? So pyoglitazone. So what about pyoglitazone? Pyoglitazone is going to produce edema and fluid overload edema and fluid retention in the body. So that is the reason pyoglozone is absolutely contradicted in patients with heart failure. So the moment they say heart failure, you should stop pyoglozone. Never give pyoglozone. No, heart failure contraindicated. Second, it can cause osteoporosis. Okay. And can cause hepatotoxicity. Okay. And can cause hepatotoxicity. And third, it can increase the risk of bladder cancer in animal models, but in humans, this has not been proven. Increase the risk of bladder cancer. That is why it is contraindicated in patients with family history of bladder cancer. It is contraindicated in patients with family history of bladder cancer. It's contraindicated. You cannot use. So heart failure contraindicated, family history of bladder cancer contraindicated. And osteoporosis is better to avoid. So look at this patient. He is already morbidly obese. Already morbidly obese. And if you give the zone, it's going to produce weight gain because of fluid retention and it's going to cause osteoporosis. So in a woman who is already having osteoporotic fracture, who is already morbidly obese, I'm definitely not going to use pyoglitazone. What about cetagliptin? Cetagliptin is not a good drug because it's just weight neutral. Okay, it's not going to produce weight loss. It's just weight neutral drug. I'm not going to use that as well. What about canagliflozin? Canagliflozin is also associated with increased risk of fractures. When you talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, what are the side effects? When you talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, two, three side effects are very, very important. Number one, genital candidiasis, very common. Many people say UTI, but actually it is candidiasis if you want to be exact. Genital candidiasis. Okay, that's the most important side effect of SGLT. In fact, most common side effect. But you have to avoid in patients with recurrent UTI. If the pain is having history of recurrent UTI, especially dangerous UTI like pyelonephritis and all, it's better to avoid. SGL2 inhibitors. But exact side effect is candidiasis. Okay, genital vulvovaginal candidiasis and penile candidiasis, balanopostitis. That's what you're going to get. Very rarely, rare possibility is Fournier gangrene. This is a black box warning, but very, very rare. You don't see that in practice. In very elderly people, you can get this, but rare. Second is euglycemic ketosis. Ketosis. It's not ketoacidosis, basically. You can get euglycemic ketosis or ketoacidosis. It's not diabetic or hyperglycemic, it's euglycemic ketosis. Especially this is common in patients with type 1 diabetes only. So we don't use this in type 1. If at all use in type 1, commonly you can get euglycemic ketosis. Otherwise you won't get. Then canagliflozin only, okay, only canagliflozin has been linked with fractures and limb amputations. Canagliflozin only has been linked to fractures and limb amputations. Canagliflozin alone. And I don't know how much it's relevant for you at an undergrad level, 
but this is based on a trial called canvas trial there's something called canvas trial that proved canaflozin can increase the risk of limb amputation fracture but subsequently one latest trial has come in 2018 that's called as credence trial okay both are basically based on canaglifosin both are canaglifosin trials so in credence they have disproved that in credence trial they didn't see any increase in limb fractures and amputations but i don't know many textbooks are still mentioning the canvas trial as the evidence but subsequently it is disproved but still this question i based on harrison this question i uh, given based on harrison only so can i flaws and i am not giving because this patient is having risk of osteoporotic fracture so in a pain with history of limb amputation and fractures i am not going to risk can i flaws so th the right choice the best drug in this individual will be semaglutide which is a glp1 and it's a oral drug so it's going to produce good weight loss okay and it's excellent for this patient so there's no problem at all other drugs are not very good so the rational choice for this question will be semaglutide it's like in fact it's the only oral glp1 that is available right now it's available in india okay it has come to india also previously last year it's not available now it is available okay so this is a typical clinical question now next one 27 year old female develops eye pain and reduced visual acuity following the initiation of treatment for a recently diagnosed graves disease which one of the following treatment is most likely should have been started again if you look at my previous lectures you will be able to answer this pretty easily so in the fmg lectures i conducted two lectures part 1 part 2 fmg uh, lectures where i have discussed in depth that's not only for fmg it's also for neat pg exams because i have discussed in depth about the graves disease also where i told like one treatment is going to increase the risk of flare of ophthalmopathy so the one treatment will increase the risk of flare of graves ophthalmopathy so what treatment will cause flare up of graves ophthalmopathy it will worsen the graves ophthalmopathy it's simple it is radioactive iodine ablation we have discussed already in previous lectures okay radioactive iodine ablation this is going to cause flare of graves ophthalmopathy so flare of graves ophthalmopathy will be seen with radioactive iodine ablation so what are the contraindications for radioactive iodine ablation It's no brainer anyone with pregnancy and lactation who is going to touch radioactive iodine ablation definitely not second patients who are having suspicion of cancer if you are suspecting thyroid cancer 100% you won't give later on you can give but right now you don't give here the clear cut indication is surgery if you are suspecting a thyroid cancer treatment is not radioactive iodine ablation so dr sg is asking which previous lectures actually we have conducted so much of previous lectures you can just go to the live section of cerebellum academy youtube channel and just see there it's there the fmg 100% revision is there in that part 2 i have discussed on thyroid so third one is going to be moderate to severe ophthalmopathy moderate to severe graves ophthalmopathy so this is these are all actually contraindications for radioactive iodine ablation pregnancy lactation suspected thyroid cancer moderate to severe ophthalmopathy these are the three clear cut contraindications for radioactive iodine ablation thyroidectomy will not cause flare propyl thyroxyl also will not cause flare even though they can cause heterotoxicity in high doses carmimazole will cause only rash remember anti thyroid drugs like carmimazole methimazole most common side effect is rash most common side effect is rash but they can cause a granulocytosis by causing bone marrow suppression so this also is very important a granulocytosis this is a dangerous side effect but it is rare rash is one of the commonest side effects of anti thyroid drugs propyl thyroxyl in addition can cause heterotoxicity additionally propyl thyroxyl can cause heterotoxicity but it has an advantage of inhibiting the peripheral conversion of t4 to t3 as well by inhibiting deiodinase enzyme and carbimazole and methimazole then are teratogenic basically carbimazole and methimazole are teratogenic and they can cause aplasia cutis we all know that so we know answer for this question is option a and coming to the question number 15 which of the following is not associated with pseudo hypoparathyroidism talk about pseudo hypoparathyroidism which of the following is not associated with pseudo hypoparathyroidism so low calcium low pth short fourth and fifth metacarpals and short stature which is not associated with pseudo hypoparathyroidism first of all what is pseudo hypoparathyroidism it is a pth receptor defect pth receptor defect so basically the problem here is pth resistance problem here is pth resistance because the problem here is pth resistance even if the pth is there it's not going to respond so the patients will have features of hypoparathyroidism serum calcium will be low serum phosphorus will be high 
okay patients will have features of hypoparathyroidism but because of pth resistance your pth output from the gland will be high serum pth levels will be high remember pth is very very important for bone remodeling right from the birth right from our birth pth is a very important molecule for bone remodeling so whenever pth receptor is defective patients can have additional skeletal deformities and the constellation of skeletal deformities in a patient with pseudo hypoparathyroidism is called as albright's hereditary osteodystrophy aho so what are the features of albright's hereditary osteodystrophy patients will have short stature patients will be short patients can have slightly lower iq patients will have round facies and patients will have brachydactyly patients will have brachydactyly so typically what they are going to have is short fourth and fifth metacarpal short fourth and fifth metacarpals so what's going to happen is you are going to see i'm seeing the four knuckles isn't it you can see okay my four knuckles so this is a knuckle this is knuckle this is knuckle this is knuckle so what will happen because of the short fourth and fifth metacarpal here there will be no knuckle there will be only dimple this is called as knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign because the short fourth and fifth metacarpals i am going to see a sign called as knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign this is also called as archibald sign okay this also referred to as something called as archibald sign so that is knuckle knuckle one second knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign so what is the right answer for this question so you can clearly see low calcium is a feature of pseudo hypoparathyroidism short fourth and fifth metacarpal brachydactyly is a feature short stature is a feature but low pth is not a feature these patients will have pth resistant so they will have high pth only okay so now another interesting thing that's called a pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism double pseudo 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 hypoparathyroidism here the patients will have normal biochemistry normal biochemistry means calcium will be normal phosphorus will be normal pth will be normal but patients will have only albright's hereditary osteodystrophy so in exam if they say patient is having only skeletal problem albright's hereditary osteodystrophy but calcium phosphorus pth everything is normal you need to answer pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism another interesting thing is i told you something called as you have a knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign that is due to short fourth and fifth metacarpal that is seen in albright's hereditary osteodystrophy typically in pseudo hypoparathyroidism and pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism so where you are going to see knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign and where i am going to see knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle sign so knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign which means here the problem is short third metacarpal short third metacarpal this is classically seen in patients with down syndrome that is knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign where you see knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle sign so here you are going to only have short fourth metacarpal short fourth metacarpal where are you going to see that you are going to see this in turner's syndrome turner's syndrome okay if you are going to see knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign because of short fourth and fifth metacarpal short fourth and fifth metacarpal that is albright's hereditary osteodystrophy you are going to see short third metacarpal so you see knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign that is down syndrome if you are going to see short fourth metacarpal so that it results in knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle sign that is turner syndrome so knuckle knuckle dimple dimple aho knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle downs knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle it is turners i think now you can understand this clearly so that's another interesting thing about this question now let us move on to question number 16 all of the following are associated with APS what is APS autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1 except so basically whenever they ask about APS it is about gland destruction destruction of the gland endocrine glands will be destroyed that's why it's called as autoimmune polyglandular syndrome we have two types of APS one is type 1 APS so both you can remember in the form of a triad this is type 1 autoimmune polyglandular syndrome this is also called as apset syndrome apesed syndrome apesed is autoimmune polyendocrinopathy with candidiasis and ectodermal dystrophy so patients will have acid ectodermal dystrophy also and it is autosomal recessive inheritance it's a rare disorder and the mutation is 
due to IR gene that is present in chromosome number 21. So you would have heard about IR gene in microbiology, in immunology especially, where it is important for uh, negative selection of T cells. They are positive and negative selection. For negative selection of T cells, IR gene is very, very important in the thymus. Anyway, because of dysfunction of IR gene in chromosome number 21, you get type 1 autoimmune polyclonal syndrome. What are the three characteristic features? One is Addison. Addison is common. Addison. Second one, patients are going to have candidiasis, recurrent mucocutaneous candidiasis because of immunodeficiency. Third one is going to be hypoparathyroidism. Remember, hypoparathyroidism. Hypoparathyroidism. This is a classic triad of episode because it is gland destruction. Low adrenal gland output, Addison. Low parathyroid gland output due to destruction. That is hypoparathyroidism. So this itself clearly says it is primary hyperparathyroidism. That is the right answer because it's the wrong statement. It is not acid. It's hypoparathyroidism rather than hyperparathyroidism. What about type 2 APS? We have type 2 autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. It is more common. It is not due to single gene. It's polygenic basically. It's a polygenic problem. It's not a single gene problem. And what is the typical triad? I told you Addison will be common in both. Okay, Addison will be common in both. But the patients will have type 1 diabetes mellitus and patients will have autoimmune thyroiditis. It could be hyper or hypothyroidism here alone. It could be Graves disease but rare but most often it will be Hashimoto's thyroid is causing hypothyroidism but some form of thyroid destruction or thyroid antibody. So Addison type 1 diabetes thyroiditis. So this is the typical feature of type 2 APS. So we are talking about type 1 APS. So the right answer for this question is option C. Then going to the next question. So 17 patients with metabolic syndrome are at a higher risk of all the following except so metabolic syndrome patients so what about metabolic syndrome so remember you have to have three out of five criteria to make a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome so what are the five, five criteria number one patient should be obese patient should be obese so according to international consensus we diagnose central obesity so we don't it's not about like just being obese it's central obesity that only will call that will be called as metabolic syndrome so that has to be defined by waist circumference, not by BMI. So one of the important things to understand here is we are not going to use BMI here for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Please understand, we are not going to use BMI for defining obesity. We are going to define metabolic syndrome by waist circumference. Central obesity is more important. So increased waist circumference. So what is the definition? Western standards, pretty much simple and straightforward. So males more than 102 centimeter and females more than 88 centimeter. Okay, so this is the Western standard. But remember, this is something that's not applicable for Asians. Asians are inherently small. You cannot use this cutoff. That's why for Asians, Japanese Federation has given a separate cutoff. For males, it is 90. For females, it is 80. This is also given in Harrison. Okay, 102 and 88. But for Asian, this is the cutoff that you have to use, ideally, 90 and 80 centimeter. Okay, number one, anyway, central obesity. Number two, presence of impaired fasting glucose or presence of frank type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. Second criteria, impaired fasting glucose or frank type 2 diabetes. Third is BP more than 135 upon 85, that is hypertension. Number four, high triglycerides, defined as a value of more than 150. And number five is low HDL. That's also as a definition for males, it should be less than 40. For females, if it is less than 50, you can call it as low triglycerides. Males less than 40 and females less than 50. So out of all, out of all, these five, okay, features, if you have at least three out of five, you can make a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome patients are at risk of gout because of hyperuricemia. One of the important complications of metabolic syndrome is hyperuricemia in case uric acid and they are at risk of gout there is no doubt about that because of more fat in the body they can develop nafld non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and nash and osa is also quite common because they are obese so alzheimer disease is not basically due to metabolic syndrome so why i kept that choice because alzheimer disease is being thought to be i mean once upon a time alzheimer disease is given in harrison also once upon a time alzheimer disease is thought to be due to insulin resistance in the brain insulin resistance in brain this is one theory that exists, insulin resistance in brain. You know that metabolic syndrome is also due to insulin resistance. And that is why many metabolic syndrome patients will have associated acanthosis nigricans and they can have PCOS also. Many patients with metabolic syndrome will have associated acanthosis nigricans and PCOS. Because Harrison states that insulin resistance in brain is one of the possible hypotheses for development of Alzheimer's disease, I have given that as an option. 
but other three can occur but the right answer for this is a simple and straightforward alzheimer disease that is not basically due to metabolic syndrome that has other other reasons coming to question number 18 which of the following is the recommended daily intake of calcium and vitamin d see i know this is a controversial question but this is a straight statement from harrison this is 1200 milligram of calcium and 400 units of vitamin d okay so that is the straight one okay straight one from harrison that's what is Harrison is mentioning but in India I know the right answer is option C straight line from Harrison but if you want to follow Indian standards that's different you can follow the PSM protocols based on the age based on the gender you can say what is the actual dose of uh, calcium and vitamin D that is required so this is what is given in Harrison but vitamin D dose is highly variable because you can go up to even 2000 units also no problem there is no harm so some studies say up to 4000 units per day is tolerable but ideally it's fourth i mean 400 international units of vitamin d coming to question number 19 all of the following are risk factors for osteoporotic fracture in a woman except early menopause history of cigarette smoking low body weight low calcium intake so all of the following are risk factors for osteoporotic fracture in a woman except just wait one second so i'll just come back in a while just one second Okay guys, welcome back. I think I'm able to see and hear me. So yes, we have only two questions left. Okay. So which of the following uh, are risk factors of osteoporotic fracture in women? And what is the only exception for that? That's the question that we are that we have been discussing so far, right? So the right answer for this question is I don't know how many of you are going to answer correctly. So it is history of cigarette smoking. So that's the right answer. This is basically a kind of a intriguing question because you need to understand that current cigarette smoking is going to be the risk factor. Remember, current cigarette smoking, active smoking is a risk factor, but not history of cigarette smoking current cigarette smoking is a risk factor definitely not history of cigarette smoking so what are the basic risk factors what do you need to know number one advancing age obviously elderly women definitely at risk no problem second previous history of fracture if anyone has a previous history of fracture that's a definite risk factor for osteoporotic fracture number three patients who are receiving glucocorticoid treatment or any steroid therapy that is corticosteroids glucocorticoid therapy number four another interesting one is parental history or family history of but hip fracture alone okay parental history of hip fracture if mother or father had a history of hip 
fracture that's a risk factor for osteoporotic fracture and number five active smoking remember if the patient is not actively smoking not a current cigarette smoker then it is not a risk factor active smoking is a risk factor number six excessive alcohol consumption too much of alcohol consumption is definitely a risk factor as well and con conditions which have chronic inflammatory conditions like for example rheumatoid arthritis any chronic inflammatory states excessive cytokines osteolysis and osteoporosis and patients also can develop something called secondary osteoporosis so what do you mean by secondary osteoporosis that is because of some other problem causing osteoporosis like there's a definitive underlying problem like hypogonadism patients who are having androgen deficiency or estrogen deficiency so hypogonadism is a clear-cut reason for development of postmenopausal osteoporosis we all know that after menopause there won't be estrogen that's why you get osteoporosis and second you're going to have malabsorption malabsorption is another important reason low vitamin d low calcium that can result in osteoporosis chronic liver disease chronic liver disease is a risk factor for development of osteoporosis as well and finally chronic inflammation like ibd inflammatory bowel disease or even premature menopause hypogonadism means menopause which can be either usual or premature menopause even premature menopause is a risk factor for development of osteoporosis whatever pravin sir is telling is absolutely correct if we ask like when did you quit they will say like last week or three days ago <laughs> that's perfectly correct they are going to say that i quit like i mean they they will say as if they have quit a long time ago but they would have quit just like like two days ago or three days ago but they will portray it as as if they have like completely stopped smoking for a long time even alcohol for that matters is also going to have the same kind of answer only okay so these are going to be the risk factors for osteoporosis in general so here early menopause that is premature menopause is a definite risk factor and low body weight is also a risk factor interestingly and low calcium intake is also a risk factor but history of cigarette smoking is not a risk factor basically so current cigarette smoking is going to be the risk factor i mean risk factor okay that is the right answer and another question they might you might be asked in exams is how to manage a postmenopausal osteoporosis how will you first identify and treat a postmenopausal osteoporosis first look at the age of the patient and uh, not age first look at any any postmenopausal woman who is presenting to you any postmenopausal female who is presenting to you so what you need to do the next step is to see whether there is history of any fragility fracture or not history of any fragility fracture so what do you mean by history of fragility fracture if the patient had some low intensity fracture like colis fracture is a characteristic example of a post i mean uh, fragility fracture or somebody who is having osteoporotic wedge compression fractures in the back if you see a wedge compression fracture that is a direct evidence of fragility fracture so any history of fragility fracture you need to intervene you need to treat for sure there is no doubt about that if the patient is not having history of fragility fractures then you have to see the age so if the patient is having age more than 65 yes or no so if the patient is aged more than 65 or not okay now i can write here if the patient is aged more than 65 then i can do something called as dxa scan dxa scan of the patient's age is not less more than 65 if it's less than 65 then i can do dxa scan by assessing some risk tools it's called frax risk tool we use frax risk tool we can assess the 10 year risk of hip fractures and uh, vertebral fractures if the frax score is high high score okay so that is dxa then you have to perform a dxa scan that's the dxa scan if the in the frax risk tool if the score is okay normal score or low score then you can go for routine management routine supplements like calcium and vitamin d okay routine supplements so like you are going to do routine calcium and vitamin d supplementation how much calcium in post menopausal men 1200 mg and how much vitamin d you are going to use you are going to use approximately around 400 units of vitamin d pravin sir thank you so much for coming and uh, you have been too kind to me and almost all of the cerebellum faculties have been very very kind to me and i have to be really thankful for that so calcium of 1200 mg and vitamin d of 400 iu so this is what you are going to give routine supplements 
and in DXS scan. So now you know you are going to perform a DXS scan. So in the DXS scan, I am going to see something called T score. If the patient is having a T score of less than minus 2.5, okay, less than minus 2.5, then you are going to start with therapy. If the patient is having a T score of more than minus 2.5, okay, more than minus 2.5, like so, we know that how to categorize T score. How to categorize T score? T score, if it's going to be less than minus 2.5, it is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. If it's going to be in the range of minus 1 to minus 2.5, that is osteopenia. Osteopenia. And it's going to be more than plus minus 1. Anything more than minus 1, it is normal. Okay, there is no osteopenia or osteoporosis. If it's osteoporosis, definitely you need to start considering therapy. If it's osteopenia, routine. So osteopenia and normal routine treatment. There is no need for any standard interventional therapy. That's what I'm going to do. So what therapy you are going to give? Even that is important, right? So now you have decided to give some therapy. So what treatment you will do? So for this, you need to see whether the patient is having significant postmenopausal symptoms or not. Significant postmenopausal symptoms or not postmenopausal symptoms or not that affect the quality of life which means patient is having so much of problem in life it should affect the quality of life just if they say i'm having hot flushes that is not significant postmenopausal that can that can occur in everyone that should basically affect the patient's quality of life which means patient should be like seriously disabled because of the postmenopausal symptoms if that is the case if answer is yes then hormone replacement therapy Okay, what is the most common hormone replacement therapy used in India right now? Estrogen patches. Estrogen patch. That's what we use for most postmenopausal women. Hormone replacement therapy is the best therapy there. But you have to do the pros and cons. You can even try like uh, SERMs also. Alternative to HRT will be SERMs. So what are SERMs? SERMs are of two types. One is called as tamoxifen. Second is called as reloxifen. So what is the difference between tamoxifen and reloxifen? So for the bone, both are agonists. Tamoxifen and reloxifen both are agonist. For breast, tamoxifen and reloxifen both are antagonists of the breast. And for uterus, tamoxifen is an agonist, reloxifen is an antagonist. It doesn't act on uterus. So tamoxifen has a small propensity to cause, okay, tamoxifen has a small propensity to cause uterine cancer increased risk of uterine cancer ca uterus risk is quite high endometrial cancer risk is quite high with tamoxifen but raloxifen doesn't have that risk but both are basically agonistic to the bone so both can be effective in reducing the risk of osteoporotic fractures and um, breast both are antagonists basically that, that's why it can be used in breast cancer patients also both tamoxifen as well as raloxifen so that is the idea of SERMs selective estrogen receptor modulator that is optional if you want you can try but remember both sums increase the risk of venous thromboembolism like dvt and p both tamoxifen and raloxifen all sums can increase the risk of venous thromboembolism so if the answer is no if the patient is not having significant postmenopausal symptoms then what will you do that's not affecting the quality of life okay if it's not affecting the quality of life then right answer will be bisphosphonates this is the first choice you have to use bisphosphonates, first choice. What are the second and third choices? Second choice is teriparatide. Teriparatide, that is nothing but recombinant PTH. Teriparatide. In Western countries, they use abeloparatide also. But in India, we commonly use teriparatide only. That is recombinant PTH. So, alternative to teriparatide is abeloparatide. Abeloparatide, which is recombinant PTH, recept PTH receptor peptide pth receptor related peptide pth related peptide recombinant pth related peptide is abeloparatide that's an alternative that's all in western countries in india it's not available teriparatide is yes very commonly used and very commonly available easily as well so recombinant pth is teriparatide third choice is denosumab that breaks the rank rankle interaction it's a monoclonal antibody denosumab that's the third option so in that bisphosphonate is something that very commonly asked in exams you have two types of bisphosphonates one is oral bisphosphonates and second is iv bisphosphonates anyone if you want you can try currently we use only third generation bisphosphonates oral very commonly we use alendronate iv very commonly use zoledronate 
So this is the most commonest bisphosphonate that we use, anandronate and zoledronate. All are basically third generation, newer generation bisphosphonates. So the most important contraindication for oral bisphosphonate is GRD because they can cause pill-induced esophagitis. The most important side effect of any oral bisphosphonate is pill-induced esophagitis. Esophagitis. But any bisphosphonate for that matters can increase the risk of certain complications like hypocalcemia. Side effect is hypocalcemia and they can also cause renal failure. So they are not very safe in renal failure. So you have to be careful. They can themselves cause nephrotoxicity. And third is they can produce osteonecrotic. Okay, osteonecrosis of the jaw. So I can write ONJ. That's called osteonecrosis of jaw. ONJ. Hypocalcemia, renal failure and ONJ. Osteonecrosis of jaw. So these are three important side effects with any bisphosphonate for that matters. All these three things you need to understand. Okay, this is the entire management of osteoporosis. This is a very regular question in your exam, so you need to be clear. Teriparatide is subcutaneous. Subcutaneous teriparatide. Abuloparatide is also subcutaneous. Okay, final question. A 65-year-old man presents the clinic with right groin. Groin pain that has worsened over the last six months. X-ray is shown. X-ray, I have not, I don't know. X-ray is not there. Sorry for that. Which of the following is the underlying cause of pain? Actually, I was about to give Paget's disease and secondary osteoarthritis so that's the right answer because I've not given the x-ray sorry for this question I will add the x-ray and then I'll post the annotated PDF so what was given in the x-ray was in the right iliac bone there was mixed osteosclerotic and osteolytic lesion any elderly man if you see an area of mixed sclerotic and lytic lesion mixed sclerotic and lytic lesion that is Paget's disease because Paget's disease is a problem of bone turnover so basically Paget's disease occurs in elderly and underlying pathogenesis is underlying pathology is with osteoblasts. Underlying pathology is with osteoblasts. Sorry, osteoclasts. The main starting pathology is with osteoclasts. Osteoclasts is the major pathology here. Because of too much of osteoclastic activity that causes bone resorption, there is a reflex increase in osteoblastic activity. Reflex increase in osteoblastic activity. So that is why you can see mixed lytic as well as sclerotic lesions. Because there, so it's a condition where you're going to have increased bone turnover. Increased bone turnover, that's the problem. In many bones you'll have mixed lytic sclerotic lesions. So because of lysis sclerosis, like lysis sclerosis, many areas there will be bone expansion and thickening. Bone expansion and thickening. Bone expansion thickening will be there. In many areas of the body that's why in USMLE exams and all they give a classic clue increase in the hat size because skull expansion is very very common so whenever they say increase in ring or shoe size it is acromegaly whenever they say increase in hat size that is Paget's disease that is because of in expansion of the skull skull bones okay you will see mixed lytic and sclerotic lesions so what will be the clinical feature most of them will be asymptomatic most common more than 90 percent patients will be asymptomatic at presentation you won't have any symptoms whatsoever so how will you pick up then you'll do a routine lft maybe for a master health checkup routine lft you are going to do in the routine lft you will see increase in alkaline phosphatase only isolated increase in alkaline phosphatase everything else will be normal so in exam they'll give a normal ggt so whenever alkaline phosphatase alone is increased with a normal GGT, it indicates an extra hepatic source of alkaline phosphatase, usually from the bone. It can occur in children also because of rapid development of bone and bone growth. In children also you can see high alkaline phosphatase uh, with a normal GGT. That's what I'm going to see in LFT. Any elderly isolated elevation of alkaline phosphatase, think about Paget's disease. That's point number one. If they are symptomatic, how they come? They come with bone pain. What is the most common site? Most common site is hip. Most common site is hip bone, hip pain. So that's why they get the pain very commonly because ileum is one of the commonest areas that are involved by pages. Many areas can be involved, but ileum is very commonly involved. Symptoms, bone pain, most common site is hip. If at all, they are symptomatic. And if they ask you most common neurological symptom, most common neurological symptom, it is deafness. Sorry, headache. Headache is the most common neurological symptom. And if they ask you most common cranial nerve, that is affected, it is 8th cranial nerve, causing deafness. Most common cranial nerve that is affected in Paget's disease is 8th cranial nerve that's going to result in development of deafness. Okay, that's the most common cranial nerve that is affected. So usually asymptomatic, 
most common symptom is bone pain most common neurological symptom is headache most common cranial nerve affected is eighth cranial nerve causing deafness these are all the important pointers that you need to know for exams with regards to Peugeot's disease Peugeot's disease can be diagnosed just with your usual investigations in x-ray nothing else is required apart from that but if at all they ask you, you can do bone scans bone scans will obviously show the areas of increased osteoblastic activity so whenever there is increased osteoclastic activity there will be increased osteoblastic activity that can be picked up by bone scans so bone scans are also pretty much useful in Peugeot disease but that's not generally required in practice it's a diagnose diagnosed based on your usual investigations and your clinical uh, features of the patient so treatment the main problem is the osteoclast here so that is the one that is hyperactivated so treatment of choice if they ask you bisphosphonates in case if you decide on therapy you give bisphosphonates that's the treatment of choice because once you suppress the osteoclast by giving bisphosphonates because they are osteoclastic inhibitors you are going to anyway clear off all the problems that are associated with Peugeot's disease. Okay, so I am not given the x-ray, I will add the x-ray and I will share the annotated PDF, don't worry about that. So in the right ileum you will see a mixed sclerotic and light lesion. that's what the x-ray I have put. But nevertheless, I think uh, we have completed the 20 questions and more, the most important topics of endocrine. So more than the actual questions that come in exam, I have told you the most important topics that you need to uh, get through before going to the exams with regards to endocrinology. I hope you have enjoyed the session and the session was very high yielding I believe and thank you very much for patiently listening for the entire three hours of the lecture and see you in the next Saturday. Until that stay tuned and bye bye. See you.